Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Let's see, I think my mic is on. Oh, it's on the hard. Oh, it's on. <laughs> Good morning. Um, thank you so much for coming out in this weather today to be here with us in person. And thank you to everyone that is joining us online. Um, my name is Rachel Milos. I'm a managing attorney with the National Immigrant Justice Center. And thank you for joining us today um, for our presentation on representing asylum seekers. Um, a big thanks to Winston and Strawn for hosting us here today. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to just everyone who has never worked with NIJC before. We're happy to see a lot of new faces and some faces that we have um, seen before. So to get started today, um, this isn't working. There we go. Um, we'll start off with the agenda here. So basically we're gonna just um, do some quick introductions um, and then Jeff is gonna talk to you a little bit. My colleague, Jeff Cibola, um is gonna be presenting with, with me today. Um, we're gonna kind of walk through the basics of asylum law this morning. Um, then we're gonna take a break for lunch um, for about a half an hour. When we come back, we'll get into talking about um, just starting off taking a case with NIJC, what that looks like, and then how to work with an asylum client specifically. Uh, we'll take another really quick break, and then finally we'll end up the day by talking about how are you going to prepare and present an asylum case, um, and specifically today we're going to be focusing on cases that we're going to be presenting in immigration court. Uh, we'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. However, if you do have a question that crops up in the course of today, please feel free to raise your hand and um, we will try to address those questions. Um, and for those of you that are joining us online, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat function, and we will try to address them then. Um, we will be offering CLE credit for today's training for anybody um, who is barred in Indiana or Illinois. At the end of the training today, there'll be a QR code come up on the screen. Um, you'll have to enter your name and also your um, bar registration number in order to get CLE credit. Um, so just a reminder that that will be coming up at the end of today's presentation. So uh, we were supposed to have a bigger staff to be presenting for you today, um, but we had some, um, a couple of our colleagues are out sick today. So Anisha Gandhi, who is our director, uh, associate director of protection based relief is out, um, as well as another one of our staff attorneys, Julie. Um, so the presenters are going to be me and Jeff, uh, my colleague who is a staff attorney on our team. Um, I wanted to put up on this slide a bunch of primary points of contact. So if you end up taking a case with NIJC and working with us, um, we do have our um, asylum project coordinator with us today. Her name is Lily Hinkle. So Lily is right here. You can see her. Um, if you take a case with NIJC, you'll interact with Lily. She's normally like your first point of contact and can definitely answer a lot of general getting started types of procedural questions about asylum cases. Um, once you get into handling a case um, with NIJC, you're going to come to either me or Jeff or Julie or Anisha with questions about strategy and things along those lines. Um, if you are interested in an Afghan case specifically, um, you can talk to Jeff um, about those Afghan cases. And if you are interested in an LGBT matter, um, you can um, reach out to Marcess, who is our LGBT project coordinator. Um, I want to just start by talking a little bit about the National Immigrant Justice Center and the work that we do. Um, we are a part of our parent organization is called the Heartland Alliance. Um, it is an organization that really um, advocates for human rights, and they do so by providing comprehensive services in health, um, in, um, in housing, in education, and employment opportunities. Um, NIJC is a legal service provider, um, and the work we do is really focused on three different pillars or prongs. So the first thing that we do with our staff of about 130 staff members is we provide direct legal services to immigrants um, on a wide variety of matters. Um, basically, we handle all kinds of relief other than business, um, education, um, and um, student visas. We don't handle those types of things, but other than that, we really work in a, in a broad-based um, immigration form of relief. Last year alone, we served over 10,000 non-citizens um, and provided direct legal services to them. Um, because we do have a small staff, we obviously could not do this work without the support of our pro bono network. So last year, we worked with over 2,000 pro bono attorneys to help provide these legal services to our clients. Um, 
In addition to the direct representation work that we do, we do have a federal litigation team at NIJC that works to advocate and challenge unfair laws, practices, and policies in the immigration landscape. And finally, we have a third wing, which is our policy team, which is based out in Washington, D.C., and they really work to advocate at the national and local level to um, implement and, and, and work towards immigration reform. Um, we do have five offices currently around the U.S. Um, our main office is based here in Chicago. Uh, we do have two offices in Indiana uh, where we do have a large client base. Um, and we also have our policy team, as I mentioned, is out in D.C. And we have a last office in San Diego doing some of our border work. There are lots of different pro bono opportunities at NIJC. Um, today we're kind of talking specifically about asylum work, but... Um, we do have a number of different opportunities that are available that may be a, a better fit um, at certain points in your, in your careers. Um, so there's something called special immigrant juvenile status. This is uh, a form of relief that is available to um, children that are under the age of 18. And usually these children have to have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one of their parents. So what the pro bono attorney would do is they would help that child to obtain a predicate order in state court, um, after which point that child could file what's called an I-360 application, which is an application for special immigrant juvenile status, which affords a path to legal permanent status um, here in the United States. We also have a number of clinics um, to help clients renew their DACA applications, um, to work towards naturalization. And also once clients are granted asylum here in the United States, they are eligible to petition for family members that are back in their home countries to come and join them here in the US. So we also have clinics to help and assist with that. Um, on our asylum project, Jeff and I specifically work on our non-detained, um, with our non-detained clients, but we also have a detention team that works specifically with our detained clients who are seeking asylum. Um, we also have a kids project at NIJC that specifically works with kids who are seeking asylum. Um, and then because of the influx of Afghan asylum seekers in the United States, NIJC started up an Afghan project recently, and Jeff is a part of that team as well. And so now we have a number of Afghan matters that are eligible for pro bono placement. Um, VAWA and U visa relief are other types of relief that people can apply for if they've been victims of certain crimes here in the United States. And you can help um, file petitions um, for those applications for individuals. And then finally, we have an LGBT team at NIJC that specifically woke, uh, works with LGBT individuals and trying to find um, support them in different forms of relief that they might be eligible for. So the way that our programs work at NIJC is an immigrant is first going to come into contact with NIJC in some way. So they can either call NIJC, they can go to immigration court. Um, and at immigration court, NIJC has an immigration court help desk, which is where some of our attorneys are basically on staff there at the immigration court, where people can just come up to them and talk to them, ask questions about their immigration case and see if they're potentially eligible for, eligible for certain forms of relief. Um, and sometimes we get referrals from, you know, um, individuals who will reach out to us on behalf of clients. Um, once, a, once we determine that a client wants um, and is interested in applying for asylum, then a team member on our asylum team will conduct an in, uh, intake interview with that individual. Usually that interview is a couple hours long. Um, we'll ask a whole bunch of questions about their life, what happened to them, why they fled to the United States. We'll determine if they have a fear of return. And then basically we'll do an assessment to determine if we find that they are eligible for asylum. Um, if we determine that they are and we decide to accept their case, NIJC will sign a retainer with that client. So basically we will let them know we are going to represent you in your case. Um, but because we do have a small staff at NIJC, what we normally try to do with all of our cases is we try to place them with pro bono attorneys. So um, we start looking for pro bono partners who will agree to take on and accept their cases. If we do find a pro bono attorney or team that decides that they do want to represent one of our clients, then what... Uh, what happens is we shift the case over to that team, but we do uh, we do keep a retainer on file with that individual and we do remain of counsel with that client um, so that we are still sort of dually representing that client along your side. Um, we will continue to provide support to you on that case. Um, we will review any documents that you have and we will provide technical assistance, meaning that if you have any questions, you can call us, you can email us, we will get on the phone with you and we will try to walk you through the steps of what needs to happen or what needs to be done so that you feel confident and comfortable representing your asylum seeker. So why are pro bono so important um, for our clients? You know, essentially it's because non-citizens do not have the right to 
an attorney um, in immigration court. So if our clients don't have attorneys, they need to proceed pro se. This chart, I realize, is extremely difficult to read, and so it's almost comical, but I will tell you that I took a look at it, and in Chicago, um, this is basically showing what the grant rates are, and it's about 25% in Chicago. So we're talking about 75% of asylum cases are denied in Chicago Immigration Court. Um, at NIJC, with the cases that we accept and with the pro bonos that we work with, we have over a 90% grant rate for our cases. So I think that can just show you the critical difference that it makes to have an attorney in these cases. Um, because asylum law, you are going to find after J Jeff walks you through the steps today, is pretty complicated. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of pieces that go into putting together a good, strong asylum case for your client. So just having an attorney by your side makes all the difference in the world. Um, and we also, you know, can't be successful all the time. Some of these cases are going to go up on appeal. Oftentimes our pro bono attorneys will continue with those cases at the appellate level. And the goal is to make some really good binding law and binding precedent that is then going to impact and affect all asylum seekers moving forward. We also like to kind of emphasize the fact that if you decide to take a case, um, it doesn't just help the one client that you are working with. Um, as I mentioned, we have a limited capacity at NIJC um, and we sign retainers with clients. So if we can't place them with pro bono attorneys, we need to represent them in-house. So every time you take a case off our list, that means it opens up a slot for another client to be accepted for representation at NIJC. Um, in addition, you know, we have heard from many of our pro bono attorneys that this is great experience for them. Oftentimes, if you are a corporate attorney and you're coming to us, you usually don't have the opportunities to be in the courtroom, to work on your trial skills, to work with clients firsthand. And so this is really an opportunity to take control of a case from start to finish, to work firsthand with a client, um, to sort of put the whole case together, to walk into a courtroom, to sharpen those trial skills. Um, and so we really think that this can be beneficial for our pro bono attorneys as well. Um, and finally, um, if, as, as I mentioned earlier, if a client is granted asylum, oftentimes they have left behind family members back in home country because they needed to flee urgently or they didn't have the finances and the funds to bring their entire family at the same time. So if a client is granted asylum, then you also, you know, they can petition for their family members, their family members can derive asylum through them. So essentially you're helping their entire families as well. Um, in terms of resources, a lot of times I think it's daunting to say, I'm going to take on an asylum case, but I don't know anything about asylum law. I'm not trained in asylum law. I don't have the resources or the know how to do one of these cases. What we try to do is make it as easy and straightforward as possible for you to be successful in putting together one of these cases. So we have a whole bunch of resources um, available at your disposal um, that you can use to make you feel confident that you are going to prep an excellent case for your client. Uh, so the first thing we have is an in-depth asylum manual. Um, Lily is going to drop a link. Um, it's basically found on our website, which is listed there in yellow. And it's just our uh, manual. We just updated it recently. So all of the information in there is, is current and up to date. Um, it really walks you from start to finish through asylum law and also all of the types of hearings that you will be attending with your client and all of the types of materials that you'll be expected to prepare for your client. Um, we also have a number of other webinars that are reported that you can watch um, and look at. Some of them are specific to how to prepare an affidavit. Some are specific to how to work with an interpreter. Um, and so you can take a look at those as well on our website. We have a number of country conditions resources that are already prepared. Um, we have a lot of clients from Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico. Um, so we've handled a lot of cases. So we've compiled a whole bunch of country conditions evidence, um, which in asylum cases, we need to educate the court about what is going on in your client's home country um, so they can understand your client's claim and why your client is afraid to return. So we have a bunch of resources we can pass your way as far as that goes. Um, we also have some practice advisories. Anytime there's a change in a law or a policy, we try to put updates on our website um, and include practice advisories to kind of give you tips about, you know, best strategies for presenting your cases. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we are always available to answer any questions um, about your case. Um, so you can always reach out to us. You will be, you know, given a point of contact at NIJC when you when you take on a case. You'll know who that is, and you know we are we are there to really um, support the whole way through. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. All right. Um, and now we are going to talk through um, some basics of asylum law. Um, 
obviously we're not going to in 45 minutes address every um, possible thing that can come up and there will probably be some questions um, about the various nuances of cases that um, you might run into. And again, um, I'd point to all of those um, sources that Rachel just mentioned as um, you know ways to kind of supplement what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but but the point right now is just to, to kind of give you a very general overview of um, what the elements of a successful asylum claim are and um, what the legal points are that you would need to argue for um, a client who, who is applying for asylum. And um, if you know nothing about asylum law, you probably know this very generally that um, it's something people apply for when they do not feel safe in um, their country of origin and they um, are applying to the United States for protection. More concretely, um, the Governing statute, the Immigration and Nationality Act, um, defined, um, has a whole, whole section, section 208, um, that goes through all the requirements for asylum. And it, uh, and the key provision um, says that an individual who is in the US or at a port of entry to the US can apply for asylum if they um, can qualify for asylum if they meet the definition of a refugee, right? Um, and then the definition of refugees in a different part of the statute. And we're going to spend a lot of time with the sentence in the next um, 40 minutes or so. So um, it's a lot. Don't don't worry if um, you can't absorb the entire sentence at this moment. We're, we're going to break it down, um, but just to start getting familiar with it. A refugee is any person who is outside any country of such person's nationality and who is unable or unwilling to return to and is unable or unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country because of persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. Um, and as we're going to see, every word in this definition has been um, interpreted and reinterpreted over the 40 or so years since this um, provision was added to the INA, and they all have very specific meanings that, um, that, that every applicant needs to meet. And this goes back to what Rachel said a moment ago. That's why attorneys are so important here. It is incredibly hard for someone running from um, some, you know, danger to their life and well-being to say, and here's exactly um, in detail the people who are after me and why they meet this legal definition in you know this country and language that I don't know. Right? Attorneys are incredibly important for articulating these claims. And so when you take that sentence and you break it down to pieces. And again, we're going to go through each of these in depth, but but just so you see them broken out. Well-founded fear of persecution. The persecution has to be perpetrated by the government or an entity that the government cannot or will not control. And there has to be a causal element. It has to be on account of one of five um, protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, membership, and in a particular social group. Um, we'll come back to this momentarily. Um, but just to give you the, the really, really like thousand foot overview, um, whenever we're talking about the law for asylum and really kind of any immigration benefit, we're looking at three main sources of law. The first is statutory. Um, and again, that's the Immigration Nationality Act. The second is agency law, right? Um, it's DHS and DOJ are the agencies that, that are going to be deciding these applications. And so um, the Code of Federal Regulations will be the kind of main black letter governing law, but there's also a whole array of policy memos, the Immigration Court Practice Manual, things like that, that, that have um, some force in this sphere. And then the third type of law that, that um, is crucial is case law. Um, so Seventh Circuit case law is going to be binding locally. Um, and then there is an entity that you may be hearing of the first time called the Board of Immigration Appeal Appeals. Um, and basically that's the um, appellate board within the Department of Justice. So if you go through an immigration court or dissatisfied with the result, with the result you can appeal it to the Board of Immigration Appeals and they publish a variety of decisions which will be binding unless they conflict with Seventh Circuit law, in which case Seventh Circuit law supersedes. Um, 
another important consideration to know um, going into this and to the extent that this affects any case that you may um, um, pick up with us, um, we will flag any issues that exist with, the, um, with this one year filing deadline and, um, and help you work on arguments to get around it if it is a problem. Um, but, but essentially the, the, the thing just to be aware of is that from the time you enter the US, you have a period of one year to file for asylum. And if you do not file for asylum within that one year, you're um, going to need to show that you, um, you fit one of several exceptions, um, generally based on either changes in conditions um, in your, sometimes in your own life, but, but usually in the country that you're fleeing, or it could be based on something that, that um, is called extraordinary circumstances, which we won't get into right now. But the, the thing to remember here is that generally you have to file with one, within one year of arriving in the US. Here's the um, first page of the asylum application. Um, don't worry, we're not gonna go through the whole form right now um, because that would be exceedingly boring. But um, we wanted to flag just a couple of things here um, because you'll notice that it's called the application for asylum and withholding of removal. And also that right at the top of this form, there is a box that um, asks if you're also applying for relief from the Convention Against Torture. Um, and generally anyone who's applying for asylum um, will want to check that box and apply for all three forms of relief at once, asylum, withholding of removal, and um, relief under the Protection Against Torture, uh, sorry, the Convention Against Torture. Um, and essentially, um, in practical terms, asylum is the main thing that you're seeking, but the other two um, options are um, potential other ways to gain permission to remain in the US and to have work authorization if the asylum claim is barred for one of many possible reasons. Um, and we're gonna focus on asylum today, but just look at the others briefly. Um, for withholding of removal, um, you'll notice that there's a higher um, standard. Instead of a um, reasonable possibility of harm or well-founded fear of harm, you have to show a clear probability, more than 50% chance that you'll be harmed. And then everything else kind of follows that asylum definition that we looked at earlier. For um, Convention Against Torture Relief, or um, CAT, as it's generally abbreviated, um, technically it, it breaks into two forms, withholding and deferral. The, the difference doesn't really matter at the moment, um, but you have to show torture, which is different from persecution and has a whole different legal standard. Um, you do not need to show that it's on the basis of a protected ground. Um, but there is a higher burden for the level of government involvement rather than just a group that the government's unable and unwilling to control. Here you have to show that um, the torture was by the government or with the government's acquiescence. Um, and again, it's that high burden of proof that we saw with withholding, the um, 50 percent, uh, more than 50 percent chance. Um, so in general, um, you would request all, and this is kind of breaking down some of the changes uh, or the differences between them. Um, and um, the main thing that I, I want to point out on this chart is asylum brings a lot of benefits that do not exist with the other forms of relief. Um, with asylum, you can petition for family members, spouse, and unmarried children under 21 to um, join you. Um, th th there's more opportunity to travel abroad, and you can eventually get a green card and citizenship through that path. Um, withholding and CAT will allow you to ruin the US, but there is no path to citizenship there. Um, there, there is no way to petition for family members, um, and um, you're not able to travel. Okay, so now um, we're going to go back to that definition um, that we were looking at, and we're going to kind of break down each of these elements of an asylum claim. And um, things are about to get interactive in a couple of slides. So if you haven't been paying attention, now's the time to rejoin and um and, and be ready um all right so again five elements all clearly interrelated to each other right this is um they're, they're, they're all very closely tied to each other um but it's really important when you're thinking through an asylum claim to keep each of them separate because um when an adjudicator an asylum officer or an immigration judge is 
considering whether someone's applicable, if they uh, whether someone's eligible, they will um, go through each of these elements separately. And there are sort of different standards and different legal definitions that apply to each of them. Um, so we're gonna start with the well-founded fear element. And the initial burden is always gonna be on the applicant to show that there's a reasonable possibility of harm if they return to um, their country of nationality. Um, and reasonable possibility, that doesn't mean that it's more likely than not, right? That means that um, there's a pretty solid chance or the way it's been articulated um, by the Supreme Court and by various courts of appeals is a one in 10 chance of um, persecution on the basis of protected grounds if you return. And there are two ways of establishing this. Um, either you can establish it through showing that harm has already occurred on account of a protected ground, um, or you can show that even though no harm has ever occurred to this person, uh, there's that reasonable possibility, the one in 10 chance that it will happen in the future. Um, and as a practical matter, if you have both arguments, you want to argue both in the alternative. Um, th there, there's no kind of contradiction between the two. Um, and so if we break those two down, right, and look first at past harm, um, one way of meeting this brain is showing past persecution plus all the other asylum elements that we're going to get to. And if you can show that this has already happened to the applicant in the past, that they've been persecuted, then you have a rebuttable presumption of um, that the fear of future pers persecution is reasonable. And there is um, just two ways that the government can rebut that. Either showing changed circumstances, um, you know, for example, there has been a re revolution and the party that the applicant was a member of before and they were persecuted for being a member of that political party. Now that party is in control, right? And so you don't expect them to um, be persecuted on that count if they return because the political situation has changed so fundamentally is an example. Um, or um, if there's a safe and reasonable, keyword reasonable opportunity of internal relocation. So say someone fled a relatively large country and there are parts of the country that they could easily um, find a job and live in and they would be completely safe and the government is able to show that convincingly to the adjudicator. That would be the other way of rebutting the presumption. Now, um, the other way of showing well-founded fear is just focusing on the future. And in that case, you have to show that the applicant's fear of returning is subjectively genuine. They actually are afraid of returning, right? And as simple as that, there isn't like a complicated standard you need to memorize for subjectively genuine, genuine fear. Just they actually don't, they're actually afraid to go back. Um, and that is objectively reasonable. And objectively reasonable is that reasonable possibility standard that we talked about before, that um, there's at least a 10% chance of persecution occurring. And again, that there isn't a safe, um, reasonable internal relocation op option. Okay. Now, um, let's look at persecution. So it's a reasonable fear of persecution. And um, this is a good time to mention that for a lot of these categories, um, there hasn't been especially clear agency rulemaking to create like a black letter definition of um, what exactly qualifies as persecution. Um, the best standards that we have and what we rely on um, is from the case law, from the Seventh Circuit and from the Board of Immigration Appeals. And so the governing Seventh Circuit case on the persecution question is um, Stenoykova versus Holder. Um, and it explains three ways that you can meet the burden of showing that the harm either suffered or feared rises to the level of persecution. It can be significant physical force against the person's body, the infliction of comparable physical harm without direct application of force. So, so think um, being confined to a space with um, greatly limited access to food or water, or sleep deprivation, um, things like that, or non-physical harm of equal gravity. Um, so non-physical harm could take the form of threats, um, the um, kind of prototypical threat would be a credible death threat, 
um, by an armed assailant, someone holding a gun on you and saying that they will kill, kill you um, is sort of the, the clearest example of reaching the standard. But um, th there's, I think, a lot of space to argue that other types of threats could rise to it. Um, now, with the standard, there are a couple of important ca caveats to keep in mind. One of them is that if your client is a child, a lower level of harm may be sufficient to rise to persecution. Um, th that there's case law and there are agency guidelines that um, suggest that harm to a child um, can be regarded a little bit differently than harm to an adult, and that it may be a lower bar to reach persecution. Also, when you talk about persecution, it's cumulative. A lot of people have been through a lot of um, different encounters with the same persecutor, and the adjudicator needs to look at all of them together. Um, can't just isolate insta instances. Um, and so that, that, that that's just another important point to keep in mind. It's not that every single um, act of persecution rises to this level. It's that the record as a whole rises to that level. So now is where I need input from all of you. We have um, two scenarios, and we're going to return to these again and again um, throughout the rest of the presentation and in the next one. Um, so let's see them one at a time. I'll read through them this time, um, and then hope we remember them uh, going forward. Um, but uh, as I read through them, I, I want you to um, think about what harm is encountered by each of these two clients and um, whether you think you could argue that it rises to the level of persecution. So let's start with Christopher. Christopher is a teenager from Venezuela. Police beat him and held a gun to his head after seeing him leave a neighborhood where an anti-government protest was ongoing. After he reported the attack to a police station, pro-government militias spray painted traitor on his home and stalked him when he went to school. Christopher's mother sent him to the United States, fearing things would worsen if he remained. Um, all right, so in, in that paragraph, um, what harm do you see that might um, be argued to be persecution? Yes. Uh, from the police and from, uh, from government gangs. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. So, the, I mean, the police physically beat him. So, so, so I think that that, that clearly is going to fall in that category. Um, what else? If you could repeat what people say, just so that I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so um, the, the, the comment was significant physical harm from the police and the militias. Yeah, so the spray painting trader on his home. Um, and yeah, I, I agree that that, that that would likely also um, raise persecution and might need a little more information about um, how, how he interpreted that, whether it was a threat to his life, whether they were taking some kind of claim to, to his house, things like that. But, but I think that um, is absolutely a good example. Does anyone see maybe one other instance of not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, stalking. Um, the, the, the stalking, the kind of inti um, intimid intimidating behavior, um, making him fear for his life and safety. Um, and just so we can move on to the next one, I would also mention the holding a gun to his head is, is um, sort of, um, that, that's a classic threat of, of death. Um, but let, let's move on to Norma. So Norma grew up in an abusive home in El Salvador. When she was 14, she moved in with a 30-year-old man named Carlos, who said he would take care of her. She became pregnant at 15, and Carlos began to abuse her. Norma had no means to support herself and depended entirely on Carlos for money. When Norma tried to leave Carlos, he threatened to take their child. When she was 25, Carlos witnessed a gang mur murder, and the gang started threatening him, Sandra, and their child. They fled the country soon after. Um, so what acts of persecution do you see here?
Hey, good. Yeah. So, so threats against him and his family. Um, maybe one more. Yes. Okay. Yes. The, um, yeah. I mean, this is another case where there, there is um, physical violence. Um, yeah. Good. Um, and we will return to Christopher and Norma um, shortly. So just try to keep these stories in your mind and we'll see how the other elements apply to them. All right. So as we well founded fear of persecution, and then it also matters who um, committed or what in the future commit the persecution. Um, so the identity of the persecutor is go going to be um, crucial. Um, and as, as I said before, either the government has to be the persecutor or an entity that the government is unable or unwilling to control. Um, so examples of, of government persecutors could be the police, the military, um, security forces, presidential guard. Um, but it doesn't have to be at a sort of nationwide level. It could be um, a local authority, say a mayor. It could be more local village chief. Um, it could be local um, police force. Um, and then paramilitary and gangs are, are also listed here with question marks because they can have kind of quasi-governmental status, right? So um, paramilitary forces are, you know, generally speaking, unacknowledged military forces that may be working in concert with the government and may be functioning as an arm of the government. Um, but you would have to make that argument um, in your briefing that that is the case. Um, certainly with gangs, you know, even though probably most of us tend to think of them as non-state actors, um, there are a number of places where um, they have such local control that, um, you know, it's actually the gangs that you would depend on for maybe even your utilities, for protection, for, for things like that um, to, um, and, and so there are instances where gangs are arguably, um, government entities, um, that, that, that's an argument that's very commonly made in reporting on El Salvador, for, for example. Um, then flipping to entities that the government cannot control, right? The, the point here is, um, you know, essentially that, that there isn't a way of getting protection from the government from the persecutor. And so again, gangs um, could fall into that category, paramilitary could again, um, guerrilla groups, family members um, could. So, so it doesn't have to be an organized group necessarily. Um, it doesn't have to be a larger organization. It, it could be one's own family, um, vigilantes, other political parties, and then we, just openly others because um, any entity that the government cannot control will fall into this category. And so, um, you know, sometimes it, 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 you can think creatively about um, who else might fall into it. Um, but the, sorry, but before we go, go back to the hypotheticals, the thing that I just want to emphasize is it does not have to be the state. Um, but is the state, um, you know, that, that obviously qualifies, but there are a lot of other possible persecutors who qualify under the statute who are not the state. All right, so let, let's go back to, sorry. Let's go back to um, Christopher and Norma. And um, let's talk about who the persecutors are in these two situations. So again, remember Christopher, um, teenager from Venezuela. Um, who is committing the harm in this case? Carlos and uh, the gang. Um, for, I oh, believe, I'm talking about Christopher. Um, the okay, the police. Um, anyone else knows any other um, people committing harm in this scenario? Good, yes. So um, police and also pro-government um, militias. 
Um, so you have a one very clear government actor, right? The the the, the police, and then um, the militias have maybe that kind of more ambiguous status, like the degree of their relationship to the government um, is something that you'd have to try to ascertain through country conditions, information, and things like that. Um, okay, and uh, I think we already have a hint on the next one, but Norma, who who is um, causing the harm? Can Please. Uh, Carlos and the yeah, exactly. So um, on the one hand, you, you have her partner, Carlos, who's a non-government actor, but um, you know, the, there may be an argument that um, you know, if, if this is a country where um, domestic violence crimes are not prosecuted, for example, um, the government is unable and willing to control. And um, and then there's also the gangs who who have threatened her and um, are also likely outside of the government's ability to um, provide protection. Good. Okay. So now we move um, into um, an element we call nexus. Um, it's the causal element, um, and. Uh, and I already said that, that we need to keep all five elements separate, but um, this one I, I really want to emphasize because it's really easy to conflate the um, kind of element of causation with um, the pr protected grounds and, and to, to kind of get that lost in the, the analysis. Sometimes you even see it get lost in um, immigration judge opinions. So um, I want to just really emphasize when you think about it, keep this one separate. The persecution that we just described has to be on account of a protected ground. And um, this on account of has its own kind of case law, its own um, meaning that, um, and so the general way of defining it is that the protected ground, and we'll go through the protected grounds in a moment, but the relevant protected ground must be at least one central reason for the persecution. Knows at least one central reason. So not the central reason, not the only reason, um, not the main reason, right? It, it just has to be a central reason for, um, you know, whatever acts of persecution we're talking about. And because it's just a central reason, the persecutor can have mixed motives, right? So let's say... Um, you have a family member who is in a gang and um, that puts you on the gang's radar and they start um, targeting you for, for um, all kinds of threats and extortion and you know physical harm because of that family member. But also you're not paying the extortion demands and so they're mad at you for not making a payment to them, right? Um, those two... So th there are multiple reasons why the gang is angry at you. And um, if you wanted to make an argument that you're being targeted for being the family member of your relative who's a gang member, um, you don't have to show that that's the only reason you're being targeted. Um, it's fine that there are other reasons why the gang would be upset, other um, motives for behavior, um, because the case law is clear that you can have mixed motives that very rarely um, is whatever entity is causing harm going to be so narrowly focused that they only have one thing they care about when they're harming you, right? They're, they're generally going to have more than one reason that they're behaving this way. And that's fine. That's covered by a statute. Um, the, the other thing um, that, that's important is, you know, it can be really hard to... Um, show direct evidence of a persecutor's motive, right? There, there are cases where it's easy. Like if during the Islamic Republic government of Afghanistan, you um, cross the Taliban, there's a good chance they would drop a letter at your door on official letterhead saying, we want to kill you for reasons X, Y, and Z, right? Because they saw themselves as an official government. And so like having a document that is fairly bureaucratic, making the death threat, that's the thing they did, right? Um, most people, when they're threatening to kill you or attacking you, 
don't give you an eloquent description of the reason, right? Um, usually it's a um, less discursive transaction, right? Um, and so you can use circumstantial evidence. Um, you can use country condition evidence. You can use um, things that the um, client saw and heard, things that they know about the local community, things they know from friends and relatives to fill in the gaps and explain um, the motives for, for persecution. The, the persecution, like for example, um, again going back to to the gang example that that, that I've um, touched on a few times, um, you know, um, Maras in El Salvador have been in fairly um, consistent control of regions there for a long time, and there's a complex set of social norms that they abide by, and um, you know, and, and there's ample reporting on what those norms are. And you can pull all that in to explain that, say, you know, um, graffiti on a house that wouldn't clearly register as anything um, to someone unfamiliar with the context is actually a sign that the gang have claimed the house as their own territory and anyone who returns to it will be murdered. Like th things like that. Um, it, it doesn't have anything they expressly say. Um, and so, Rachel will talk about client work um, in the after lunch, but um, the thing that we, we I want to emphasize here is often um, your client will know a lot more about how to read the situation and what um, natural inferences are within their cultural context than you do. And so asking them, um, why they think that um, something was done for whatever reason or how they know that someone was behind it is often the best way of kind of getting into this question and understanding the nexus. Um, now let's move on to the, to the protected ground because um, that, that's a crucial category and it can be a little bit um, confusing. So, so, so let's um, break it down to the five protected grounds that exist under asylum law. And those are race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. Um, and the first thing to um, emphasize here is even though um, sometimes um, we people use the phrasing political asylum or the, you know, the, the sense that, that that is based on political opposition, um, not all of the protected grounds are what we normally think of as political groups, um, and some of them reach um, pretty broadly. So um, going through them one by one, um, when we're talking about race, um, this isn't exactly like the US federal definition of race. It's a broader conce concept than that. It um, brings in a um, large number of ethnic groups, like um, Congolese um, Tutsis is the example we have here. Um, and it's, and I guess it's analogous to how you normally describe race in, in, in a US legal context, but it has a few nuances and is a little bit more expansive of a category. Um, for religion, um, someone might be targeted because of what religion they belong to, what branch of religion they belong to, um, what types of um, practices they, they adhere to, right? So they could be of the same religion as the persecutor, but um, have very strong disagreements on um, how that religion is to be observed and practiced. And um, if, they were be, if they would be persecuted for practicing it differently, that would be grounds for asylum. Or um, someone could be non-religious in a heavily religious, religious country or area of a country and persecuted on that account. Um, and, and all of those kinds of permutations of um, religious um, belief, membership, practice, or, or non-practice are bases for asylum. Um, nationality, um, this is another category that can extend a little bit more broadly than we tend to be used to. Uh, certain ethnic groups and linguistic groups also fit into that one. Um, when we talk about um, political opinion, um, that could be either an actual opinion that someone has, um, or it could be one that is imputed to them um, by the persecutor. So, so um, for example, the ch child of a political activist may not be political themselves, but because they are related to this person, 
um, it's assumed that they have uh, oppositional views and they could be prosecuted on that reason, or maybe because of the region someone was born in, because of someone's ethnic group, they could also have an imputed political opinion that is related to that. And the last category is membership in a particular social group, which um, probably takes the most explanation because it's a phrase that um, would not come up in any other context and has a, um, it's a, it's a term of art. And um, we will go through it in a moment. But bef before we break down particular social group, um, just want to give you a sense of, um, you know, kind of how broad the protected grounds are and how many different types of um, situations can be encompassed by them. So, so these are some recent cases that, that we've had, a um, Nicaraguan mother and daughter seeking asylum because of their political opinions and activities, um, a young woman from Sudan who was um, being prosecuted on account of her ethnicity, um, a Somalian young man um, seeking asylum because of religious beliefs, um, Cameroonian woman seeking asylum because she is Anglophone, and a Honduran woman seeking asylum because her husband abused her and threatened to kill her after she reported him to the police. So, so sort of all of those different protected grounds we just went through, um, they do actually come up and we, we, we see all of them um, pretty fre frequently. Um, but the one that needs the most explanation um, is particular social group. Not, not that it's a especially um, complicated concept. I mean, there, there are some nuances and, and I'll, I'll say that we have a um, practice advisory available online that um, really breaks down the um, case law in particular social groups and kind of walks you through a lot of the thornier parts of um, this type of argument. But the basic idea is actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, particular social group is by all appearances added to this um, definition of a refugee because um, the first the, the UN drafters um, and then um, Congress when they adopted into US law, um, you know, realized that there are homogenous groups of people who are meaningfully connected to each other that don't fit those other four categories, right? And th this is a way of capturing some of those other groups of people that, that exist. And the legal definition that the Board of Immigration Appeals provided for it, um, that is still the governing law in the Seventh Circuit and with various mutations is the basis of the governing law everywhere else, is that um, this kind of particular social group has to be based on a common immutable characteristic that men members of the group either cannot change or should not be required to change. Right, so um, something that is a trait that um, is either fixed, unchangeable, or is kind of so fundamental that um, it would be wrong to require someone to change it. Um, and again, th there's lots of case law on this, um, and you don't need to memorize anything in this table right now. Um, it's just to um, drive home the point that Seventh Circuit case law on, on this is um, more favorable than other circuits. And um, to the extent that um, you're dealing with a particular social group definition in your brief, um, we would strongly advocate relying on the Seventh Circuit case law um, because that, I mean, A, it, it, it is binding, but but B, it, it is favorable than other circuits. Um, and so to, to avoid confusing the issue, um, drawing from, from local case law is, is um, preferable. Um, but, but a couple of things to, to um, point out about the controlling Seventh Circuit definition is that there is no breadth limit. So a particular social group can be extremely big. That's not a de facto um, uh, disqualifying factor. Um, there's no social distinction test. We won't talk about what that is right now. Um, so actually, I'm just going to skip that one. Um, past experience can qualify. So someone's former employment, for example, could be the basis of a um, particular social group. Um, and the groups can be diverse. In other, 
in other words, they need to have a trait that binds them together, but they can be diverse on a lot of other accounts, right? Um, and this will probably make a little bit more sense if we look at some of the um, groups that we commonly argue um, and, and that have been successful um, for particular social group claims. Um, so in the context of um, gender-based or family violence, um, there is strong case law to support the idea that um, women or girls of a particular nationality is itself a cognizable social group. Um, or um, family members is a um, widely acknowledged um, kind of um, seen as a quintessential type of social group, like the immediate family of X person, the children of X person. Um, that 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 is a um, group that you know has a trait you cannot change you cannot stop being related to someone um i mean you can legally but but sort of the fact that you're related to them will, will always be with you um and and and, and that that's a very well recognized strong category um and another one is women of a particular nationality um so salvadoran women in intimate relationships they are unable to leave um or um, women who have uh, disobeyed gender norms. So for example, Cameroonian women who have disobeyed gender norms. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, other common categories might have to do with um, being um, traits that will mark you out due to your um, relationship to, um, or I'm sorry, um, other possibilities could be in an area with very strong gang-based norms, right? Um, someone who resists or disrespects those norms, um, that could put them in a coherent social category because, um, you know, because those norms are so strong, um, the fact that you defy them once becomes a trait that you cannot change and that will follow you everywhere you go within that um, society. Um, and related to that, someone who's witnessed a um, gang-related um, activity, maybe a gang killing or something like that, and particularly if they've reported it, um, that can also become that same kind of um, trait that you cannot ever distance yourself from. Um, you know, once that's happened, that is part of who you are within that society. Um, and again, just reemphasizing the, the family-related claims, immediate fa family members, um, of either a particular person, or you could say family members of um, an Afghan who worked with the US military, family members of a former gang member. Um, you know, the, the, you can also have a kind of more generic definition of the family based claim. Um, so, th those are some examples of the groups that we've um, seen in, in the past. And, and again, for the detail, I, I'd say look at that um, practice advisory that, that we flagged, but um, so sort of the general idea is trying to find a def an important trait that the person has and shares with other people in society that is a cause for the persecution that they've suffered or will suffer. And so thinking about that and going back to Christopher and Norma, and this is the, the um, last thing to do before we take a break. So, um, uh, you know, get energized. Um, let's start with Christopher and um, think about what of those five protected grounds we just went over do you think might apply to him based on these facts? Political opinion. Good. Political opinion. And I think that is definitely the, the strongest um, kind of clearest one. Is there anything else that um, folks see that might be an option here? Oh, sorry. Uh, membership in a particular social group, either people from this neighborhood that's associated with any government activities or people who have reported. Uh, Excellent. Yes, a membership in a particular social group is, um, and yeah, and, and the the um, 
so um, people who've reported to the police and people who are from this particular neighborhood where there had been an anti-government protest and um, who might by virtue of that be um, associated with anti-government activities. Absolutely, the, the, those, those are both, um, um, yeah, the, 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 that's absolutely correct. So, so um, and, and one thing I wanna point out there is sort of the same facts, right? Um, being seen as, um, being in this neighborhood where that anti-government protest happened could give rise to either an uh, imputed political opinion claim or a um, particular social group claim. It, it, it's there, there are often different ways of framing the same set of facts um, to cover mobile protected grounds. And where you see that, it, it, um, I think generally the advice would be to explore both options because you don't know what's gonna resonate more with the adjudicator. Um, Okay, let's move on to Norma. What protected grounds do we see applying here? Yes. Um, so for Norma, uh, she's part of a particular social group. Yes, a lot of it depends on seeking asylum, asylum from him. Okay. And she's being severely abused by Norma, Carlos has witnessed this gang related crime, and Barry, Norma, and the child are also part of that family. Uh, so they would also say the gangs were witnessed for related crime. Although, said that I, I guess my question would be is how important is reporting the crime? Because if we don't have the fact that they did that, so is it still, is that something? Excellent. Yeah. I, I, no, I think that that that, that covers um, pretty much all of it. And so, I have to restate it. Just for no, no, no. Uh, sorry. Um, so, yeah. So, um, just to kind of um, restate, and uh, um, I'll, I'll try to um, cover all of it. But, but yeah, th th there are essentially two different clusters of facts here that um, both can give rise to an asylum claim. And um, what seems like the salient um, protected ground will vary depending which cluster of facts you're looking at. Um, so, so, so as you said, um, if you're looking at the abuse by Carlos, then um, in that situation, th there are probably a few different ways that you could potentially um, frame that, that particular social group, um, whether it is Salvadoran women, um, Salvadoran women without means to support themselves, um, Salvadoran women dependent on their partners for financial support. There, there, there are a few different ways you could um, potentially frame that. But um, when, but that for that cluster of facts, th th there are, um, yeah, there, there, there are at least those particular social groups in play. But then, as, as you mentioned, there's also the witnessing of a gang murder by Carlos and the threats that ensue as, as a result. Um, and so, you know, um, Norma is, um, is an asylum seeker. And even though it's Carlos who witnessed the gang um, murder, she is still a family member of Carlos and is still being targeted on account of um, relationship to, to him. Um, so as, as, as you said, witnessing um, fits into one of the um, particular social groups we just talked about. Um, and it could be a stronger social group potentially if you re reported it, but um, you know, even if you didn't, that, that, that is arguably a group that he falls into. But then as his, his family member, right? Um, as someone who, um, I mean, I guess, we, no, yeah, right, they, they all fled. So, so um, she is still um, ostensibly um, with Carlos, but even if she wasn't um, someone who had a familiar connection with him when they were in El Salvador, um, that opens up um, those family-based um, particular social groups that we um, just talked about, and um, she, she could fit into um, those as well. So a lot of people have complex lives, lots of different things happen, and, um, you know, thinking about how, but but I guess the point to emphasize is that um, different productive grounds can apply to different contexts, and you don't have to have one master that fits all of the facts. Um, 
you know, you can have different ones that cover the different instances of persecution in the past. Um, so excellent responses. Um, th thank, thank you, to everyone who responded on, on this slide. And that is going to be it for our first segment. Um, so th thank you for being with us. Um, we're gonna take a break and um, come back with working with your client and presenting your case. All right, so I, I think um, we can get back into it. Um, all right, so welcome to um, part two of today's presentation. Um, now we are going to talk about um, actually representing asylum seekers, um, kind of the steps that you need to go through practically and um, the best practices for getting to know your clients and work with them and how to actually present the case to the court. So um, let, let's jump in and we're going to start with some kind of um, basic um, logistical information that you need to, to know about um, immigration cases, immigration court, and um, so the first steps that um, you will need to take with any new case you take on. Um, and so taking this sort of the broad view, um, there are a bunch of different government agencies that are involved in um, Asylum cases. And so you can see um, on this chart in one corner, we have the asylum seekers, the families, you as the attorneys, um, you know, the, the person applying for relief and, and the people around them. And, you know, they have to deal with a just huge number of kind of um, easily confused um, government entities and acronyms to. Um, pursue their, their their case for relief. And so depending um, on what posture the case is in, you know, exactly how someone um, came to the U.S., what kind of um, interactions they had with uh, immigration enforcement, um, a lot of different entities could be involved. Um, so so um, DHS obviously does immigration enforcement. ICE is part of DHS. Um, the asylum office where you make the applications for relief is part of um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, itself part of DHS. Uh, Customs and Border Protection, also part of DHS. Um, where we're going to be focusing today is the DOJ part of this chart. Um, so the Executive Office for Immigration Review is sort of the umbrella of um, the part of DOJ that runs the immigration courts. And um, just in case this is um, new, new information because it doesn't get discussed much outside the immigration sphere, it's important to know that immigration courts are not part of a separate branch. They're not um, Article Three courts. They are within the executive, within the Department of Justice. Um, and so the branch of the DOJ that does that is EOIR, and it has the immigration courts, and it has the appellate body I mentioned before, Board of Immigration Appeals. And then um, if your client is an, um, came to the US as an unaccompanied immigrant child, then they um, are likely involved with the Office for Refugee Resettlement as well. So um, obviously this is a complex kind of web to navigate. And again, this is one of the places where attorneys can be very helpful understand um, how to interact with all these government, government bodies. Uh, thank you. And um, yeah, but, um, and, you know, and of course, this is one of the places where um, NIHAC can be helpful to our pro bono partners. Um, we can help you orient yourself with um, the various groups that are involved in your client's cases and, um, you know, and understand what exactly they need to do to keep up with them. You know, for, for example, if someone has a case in the immigration court, they might also have check-ins with ICE that they need to do per periodically. Um, there might be applications that need to go to the USCIS as well, um, and we can help you keep track of all of that. The big um, kind of distinction between types of asylum cases that um, need to know from the get-go is they can be um, either affirmative or defensive. And an affirmative application is um, an application made to USCIS by someone who is not already in immigration proceedings. The US government hasn't made kind of the first step to try to um, remove them from this country. Um, 
but you know, rather they, they, they are in the US and they want to apply for asylum because they're afraid of going back to their home country. And, and this could be someone on a visa, it could be someone who's um, um, crossed the border without authorization, but just hasn't had any um, contact with immigration officials and is still within the first year in the US. Um, you know, you can apply affirmatively to USAS and ask them to adjudicate your application in the asylum office. Um, if you land in what are called removal proceedings, which is, um, uh, I guess, commonly referred to as deportation, and that's the old term for um, what the government does. Um, in that case, you can make a defensive application, and that's a, a, an application with the immigration court, with DOJ, um, you know, basically saying that you should have relief from deportation because you are eligible for asylum. And the end result of succeeding on an asylum application is the same in both systems. Um, there, there's some like procedural nuances, but, but essentially it's the same path to a green card and to citizenship and to um, status for family members that we talked about before. Um, but generally applications are divided into these two categories, the affirmative USAS defensive DOJ versions. Um, and when an application is denied in front of USAS in the asylum office, it gets referred over to the um, Department of Justice, the immigration court, and you can argue the application anew within the immigration court. Um, so so for, for people who did apply affirmatively and um, have the AO, the asylum office adjudicate in the first instance, they, they have two chances to convince the government that they merit asylum. And if you should lose at the immigration court level, um, you can appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And then if um, you have an issue of law that, that um, would benefit from circuit review, you can go up to the Seventh Circuit. Um, and then theoretically the Supreme Court from there. Um, but th th that is um, the appellate system, first within the agency, then into the federal courts. Um, today, we're gonna be focusing on the defensive cases. Um, much of what we talk about is going to kind of carry over. Um, all of the asylum law that I spoke about in the last section um, carries over. Um, but just, um, I guess the procedures are different for both, and we'll be focusing on the um, defensive procedures um, for, for immigration court. Um, and we do have the information about the affirmative cases in the um, procedural manual that we um, discussed before that's also linked within this presentation on our website. Um, <clears throat> so first thing you need to know, um, and this is something that um, would be um, part of what we um, would tell you at the time you take a case, and actually even before you take a case, um, when we are offering them, we mark which ones are in affirmative and or defensive posture. But um, just to kind of explain what we're looking at, the way you know whether someone is in removal proceedings is um, they have to have a notice to appear, an NTA, that is lodged with the, or filed with the immigration court. Um, so the notice to appear is a, a, a charging document. It's based it's sort of analogous to an information or indictment. Um, it's the government explaining why they think someone is removable from the United States or inadmissible to the United States. And that document needs to be served on the non-citizen. And it also needs to be filed with the court. Sometimes they are served and not filed. So um, a client could have an NTA, but not actually have an immigration court case because the case doesn't exist until it's been filed with the court. Um, but generally, if they have the NTA and it hasn't filed the court yet, um, that means the case will ultimately be referred to the court and will ultimately end up being a defensive case. Um, th there, there are lots of nuances that there's, you may have seen there's been some Supreme Court case law on, on and NTAs that um, we're not gonna go, go into. So there, there are potential nuances to this, but that's the general rule that um, if they've received an NTA, it's probably, on track to end up in immigration court. And the key question is whether it's been filed with the court yet. And um, you can, we'll talk in a second um, about how you can verify that. Um, but um, before we get to that, um, 
just wanted to, to talk through the kind of initial steps uh, um, that you will need to go through when you um, receive a new case. And um, the first thing is we've mentioned it many times. Our procedural manual is great. It has lots and lots of information. It's a engaging read. You will not want to put it down once you pick it up. Um, and um, but 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 it, you know it, it's 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 very helpful, and it goes through all the stuff we're talking about today in more depth, and probably answers a lot of the questions that are lurking lurking in your mind as you're listening to this. So um, you know, definitely recommend consulting that. Um, when you take a case, we also prepare a case file with um, whatever documents we receive from the client, notes on communications with, um, with the client, um, you know, pretty much anything that we've collected during that process of intakes and screening the case that Rachel mentioned before, as well as a detailed cover letter explaining the posture of the case and um, what the crucial next steps are and um, introducing you to your um, points of contact for technical support and stuff like that. And so you want to review that file um, as probably first thing so that um, you can get up to date on all of the information that we have. Um, and then you're, you're going to want to figure out if the NTA has been filed, um, which again, we may flag in the report, but, but for those cases where um, there is one and hasn't been filed yet, you want to start checking right away um, for whether it's been filed. And on the next slide, um, we'll show you how to do that. Um, but once it is um, filed, you will want to file an appearance with the immigration court. And actually before you can file that appearance, you will need to make an account with the court. Um, there's a process called e-registry that is um, linked in the presentation for, for um, folks who have it, or if you, um, just uh, search um, EOIR e-registry, it will come up there. Um, and, and it's a, a relatively short process, um, but you, you basically just have to create an account at the court and um, generally go to, go to the immigration court and um, sh show your ID so they can um, validate that, that you are who you say you are. And that, that will, um, that combined with your um, board license will we'll give you the um, the um, right to appear in the immigration court and to file on your client's behalf. So do the registry, then file an appearance. There's an appearance for, form. It's explained in the manual exactly how you felt the appearance and all that. Um, and when you do the e registry and when you're preparing the um, appearances, you will also find out whether your case is um, on paper um, or it's a fully digital case. So the immigration court system just um, past couple of years launched a online filing system, but they didn't convert all the old cases onto that system. So some cases are still on paper and require paper filings. Other ones are online. Um, the way you know that is once you've filed your appearance into a case, um, it will show up on your EOIR login. And if it has an online filing option, then they've can, then it's in the online realm. If it doesn't have one, then it's still a paper case. Um, but again, that, that's the kind of technical thing that NIJC technical support can help you determine, but that, that's sort of the easy way to figure it out. Um, and then, what you want to do is check the status of the client's case. And this is um, finally how you find out if the NTA has been filed. Um, you can check on the EOIR um, webpage. Um, we have the link there. They have a case information page. You can enter um, a number that's called the um, airline registration number or a number, um, which will be on the NTA. It will be prominently marked in your client file. And by entering that into the system, you can see whether um, any case shows for the client in the UIR system. And if no case shows, then that means the NTA hasn't been filed yet. If a case does show, then the NTA, NTA has been filed. And there's a case in the court, and this um, website will tell you when the next hearing date is, what type of hearing it is, and the immigration judge. Um, one thing that hopefully will become irrelevant quickly for anyone who's watching this on the recorded version, 
that website is wonky at the moment. And sometimes when you um, put in the A number, it will say that there's not a case when there is a case. Um, and so for right now, if you're trying to determine whether the, the NTA has been filed, I would recommend using the automated info line that's listed there. Um, it's more reliable at the moment of recording. Hopefully they fix all the issues with the website soon. Um, but I, I just wanted to highlight that um, if you do get information about a case through the website, it should be accurate. But sometimes it will return no results when um, there actually is a case in the system. Um, but hopefully that won't be true for much longer. Um, and once the case is in the system, um, you want to be, well, actually, even before it's in the system, you want to be checking periodically to see if the NTA has been filed. And then once it's in the system, you want to keep checking periodically with um, to make sure that the immigration court dates haven't changed um, because sometimes, especially with um, recent postal issues, notice is either very late to arrive or completely um, absent. And so um, it's a best practice to keep checking the court dates um, you know, every few weeks or so, just to make sure that there hasn't been a change that you aren't aware of. Um, some There are a lot of new immigration judges currently hearing um, cases being moved across dockets, um, and you want to know about any change in your client's court date um, as soon as possible. Um, and as you learn dates, you want to calendar those. Um, clients will also um, either have or be soon to be eligible for employment authorization documents. Um, and we'll um, lay out the situation with the employment authorization in the cover letter, um, but you also want to be calling during any dates um, for when those documents need to be renewed because um, keeping up employment authorization is you know, vitally important to, to each and every one of um, our clients, and, and that's another thing that we need to keep on top of. The next thing you, you want to do once you've gotten your appearance in the system and um, you've kind of um, read the file, got, gotten a sense of the case, is file um, FOIA requests to get the um, immigration history for your client. Um, as it says on, on the slide, there is no discovery in immigration. The government in the immigration court. Um, the government will not automatically um, give you anything about um, your client's um, previous interactions with them, any documents that have been filed, things like that, right? So to know what they know, you need to file a FOIA request. There um, are um, steps for, for doing this in the manual, um, but Generally, the, the, the main one that you're filing is with USAS, and you're going to request track three processing, um, which is a type of um, expedited processing for people on removal proceedings. Um, sometimes you can get the court file and hearing tapes from the immigration court if, if there have been prior hearings in the case. Um, and if it is an unaccompanied child that we're talking about, um, as I mentioned before, they've probably had interaction with the Office of Refugee Resettlement resettlement. Um, and so you will want to request the file from that agency as well. You will also um, want to file a um, what's called a biometrics request. Um, basically, before the immigration court can grant relief on an application, um, DHS needs to fingerprint the client and run those fingerprints against criminal records and immigration history. and. Um, for complicated bureaucratic reasons, um, they will only do that if you file a request. There is a guide to how to file that request in the manual. Um, it's also information available online. It's pretty straightforward to do, but it's something you have to remember to do. Um, so if your client has not yet been fingerprinted in relation to this asylum application, then you will need to um, request biometrics even if they have um, been fingerprinted for something else, like their work authorization. They will need to be fingerprinted specifically for the asylum application, and you need to request that. Um, if it's the case that was previously before the asylum office and um, was referred to the immigration court, um, that's the one situation where you might 
um, where, where you won't have to request the biometrics because that would have that, that's already done um, for for the I-589 before the asylum office. But in other instances, you need to affirmatively request this. And um, it can take a long time to get these fingerprinting appointments scheduled. So you don't want to delay making this request. Um, and then once you get those kinds of first steps out of the way, um, you can start looking ahead to um, the case that you'll be presenting in court, which um, we'll, we'll go over in more depth in, in a moment. But just to kind of get in your head, um, the parts of um, an immigration court filing, um, generally, there are kind of like three main chunks you can break it into. And they're all extremely important. And they all um, influence each other. Um, and those are the affidavit, the legal arguments, your brief, and corroborating evidence. And out of all of them, the affidavit um, alongside your client's um, testimony in court are going to be the most important thing. Um, that, that, that's what um, really cases rise and fall on more than anything else. But making good legal argument is still extremely important and having um, corroboration is, is as well. Um, and we'll talk more about how to do that momentarily. But before we do that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to, to um, tell you a little bit about um, how to work with clients. Thanks, Jeff. So to talk a little bit about our clients, um, first and foremost, you know, we have clients that come to us from over 90 different countries. Um, our clients run the gamut in terms of, you know, we have family units that come to us. We have children that come to us. We have highly educated professionals that come to us. Um, we have, you know, individuals from small indigenous villages that have never had the opportunity to have any type of formal education whatsoever. So they can't read and write. Um, so our clients are you know, from all different walks of life, all different jobs, all different professions. Um, and I think though there are many differences, the things that unite them are the fact that all of our clients have suffered trauma. All of our clients have gone through some serious things that have caused them to flee their home countries. Oftentimes they've had to leave families behind. They've had to leave, you know, their homes behind. They've had to leave all of their possessions behind. Um, and, you know, really the thing that again, unites everyone is that they are all here seeking protection and safety um, because they are afraid to go back to their home countries. So another thing to keep in mind is just with that background and with that framework, when you're working with an asylum seeker, it's going to be a really different experience than working with regular clients um, or just people maybe that you're used to interacting with on a regular basis. Um, when individuals have come to us, again, remember they have fled violence, they have fled harm in their home countries, they've left behind family members, they often have nothing. Um, when they first get here, before they apply for asylum, they're not eligible to work lawfully in the United States. So a lot of them are really thinking about how am I going to eat? How am I going to support my family? How am I going to find a place to live? Um, and those are the things on the, in the forefront of their minds and not oh, my attorneys want to meet with me to talk to me about my asylum case and rehash all the terrible things that I had to go through in my life. So just with that framework in mind, <clears throat> know that in a lot of these cases, they are going to want to talk to you about how do I find housing? How do I find counseling for my kid? How do I find a food pantry near my home? And those things are going to come first before you really get into talking about the asylum claim with your client. That's normal. We see that as a way of building relationship with client, letting them know you're going to you're going to help them by trying to help them connect them with resources. That's what we're here for. You can get in contact with us. We will try to, you know, send some resources your your way, but really the way that you can build that bridge with your client and sort of gain some trust and buy in from your client so that they're going to feel comfortable opening up to you is to sort of address these um, immediate needs that they have first. Um, kind of along with that sort of trauma history that they have a lot of times, you know, some clients have suffered some serious physical abuse um, and harm. And a lot of times that is going to, you know, have been head injuries or things like that that are going to affect memory. Um, also, just highly traumatic uh, events are going to affect memory and ability to recall certain events. So they're not going to be able to come to you and from start to finish, tell you exactly what happened in chronological order. And everything isn't going to make total sense from the outset. 
Um, things are going to come piece by piece, <laughs> bit by bit along the way. So just kind of knowing that that's the type of client that you may need to deal with. And this isn't in every case. Some of our clients are, are, you know, completely comfortable talking about everything, but oftentimes that's the background that they're coming to you with when they first arrive um, in your, in your office. So with all that being said, you know, the first time you meet with clients, um, the most important thing to do in our minds is to build rapport with that client. So start off by introducing yourself, by maybe sharing something about yourself with the client, making small talk about the weather in Chicago, which a lot of them are like completely miserable, you know, about because they're used to coming from really tropical warm places. And now they're experiencing winter and snow for the first time. Um, and then once you've kind of broken the ice with your client a little bit, you can really get into talking a little bit what, about what your role is going to be. So you can let them know, you know, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not, um, you know, a tax preparer. I am here to help you with your asylum case. So really, so they understand the scope of what your representation is going to be in that case. Um, and also really importantly, letting them know that what they talk to you about is going to be confidential. A lot of our clients come from countries where, you know, there seem to be networks everywhere that can be listening and overhearing what they are saying. And that is very scary and very dangerous for them to reveal information about their political beliefs, about their religious beliefs, about these things to anyone. So they come very guarded and they need to know that what they tell you is in confidentiality because you are their attorney. Um, coupled with that is that oftentimes they're going to come with family members or they're going to come with community members who are trying to be helpful and supportive. And so they want to sit in on all the conversations that you're having with them. But you need to explain it's really important that I get to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you to protect this confidentiality that we have in our conversations. So oftentimes it's great to meet family members or community members that are supportive, but then to let them know I need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about your case so that everything will remain confidential between us. Um, also, you know, it's really important because sometimes if a husband is there with a wife, maybe the wife is not going to open up about specific things with him present, or if children are in the room, they're not going to want to share and open up about certain things that happen to them if children are present in the room. So yet another reason why confidentiality and those one-on-one -on -one conversations are going to be critical in these asylum cases. Um, again, in a first meeting, it's really good to just talk about what's going on now. This is a, hopefully a safer place for them. It's a safe space. So to talk a little bit about, you know, if they have kids, are your kids going to school? How are they liking it? Are they learning English? And just really getting into some small talk about what's going on here. You can use that information to start building out their affidavit, but it's a safer, easier thing for them to start um, off talking to you about. The second thing really important to do is making a plan for communication. So again, with clients, these are individuals who often don't have stable housing, stable income sources, and so they may not have a stable cell phone. So that phone may get shut off because they can't pay for it. Um, they may have you know, phones that they pay for sort of by the by. So it's really important to talk to them about how can I reach you? Um, is it better to text you? Is it better to use WhatsApp? Sometimes they need to use free services because they need to pay for text messages or other things like that. So really figuring out how can we contact you? Do you have email? Do you have these other sources? Um, making sure that they understand how to communicate with you. Along with that is they are probably in a lot of these cases not going to be English speakers. So how are you going to communicate with your clients? Oftentimes what we do when we have clients with languages that we don't speak um, is you can use Google Translate for easy texting back and forth. That works out great. Um, but anytime you're going to have a substantive conversation or meeting with them, you're going to need to find an interpreter who can help you so that that individual can express themselves. And we know that what they're telling us is, is going to be accurately represented in the documents that we are putting together. Um, also talking to them about transportation, you know, can they get to your office? Um, Lily and I are currently working with a client who, you know, was relying on a friend, um, to borrow his car so he could come to meetings at our office and was basically like, I don't know how to use public transportation. I never have. And was like, I can't get to your office. I mean, he was stopped. He couldn't do it. So meetings cancel, meetings cancel. And then he finally got to our office using his friend's car and Lily walked him through step-by-step step how to use the venture app, how to find where you're going, how to get to our office making a plan so that he felt empowered, he felt comfortable, he knew how he could get to your office. So I think a lot of times we see communications issues crop up in cases working with asylum seekers. And I think you think, oh, my client's just not being responsive or my client's not communicating, but it's really because your client maybe can't communicate, your client doesn't know how to communicate, your client doesn't know how to leave a voicemail message, your client doesn't know how to get to your office. 
So really trying to walk them through those things to make sure that you can have those meetings that you need to be having in those cases are important. Um, next, I would say talking about a roadmap. What is your work together going to look like? So these asylum cases can sometimes take a while. Um, you know, maybe there's a hearing that's coming up. It's called a master calendar hearing. It's a short little type of status hearing. Maybe that's set for October. At that hearing, you're going to get a future date where they are going to present their asylum case. It's called the merits hearing, which is basically like their trial on their asylum case. Maybe that's going to be another year out into the future. Maybe it's going to be set out even further out into the future. So sort of managing their expectations, letting them know what the plan is going to be, how things are going to proceed moving forward um, is really helpful at that time. Um, and then engagement letters. So we always sign a retainer with our clients. Ours is a really short, straightforward little, you know, one and a half pager that we talk clients through as we're having them sign it. Um, I've seen some retainers from your firms and they are very big and they are very scary. So I would say definitely, you know, take the time to take that retainer out and really put it in language that they can understand take out the legalese, simplify it so that they, again, feel empowered. They know what they're signing. They understand the, the scope of your representation and what that is going to look like. Um, and then another great thing to do is have them sign forms while they are in the office. One of the hardest things to do sometimes is getting mail to come back and forth to you. Um, and again, sometimes if clients live a couple hours away, it's a big ask to say, hey, can you come to our office to sign some forms when they need to pay for transportation, they need to do all those types of things. So, so really saying the first time around, I'm going to have you sign a whole bunch of forms so that I have them and they're ready to go when I need to file these things. Because unfortunately, in immigration land, a lot of things require wet signatures from your clients still. So just keeping that in mind and taking care of that from the outside is a good, good move. Um, the bold red at the bottom is just don't dive right in and be like, so tell me about all the worst things that happened to you on your first meeting with client, build some relationship first, save that for letter, unless the client is dying to tell you everything and they are ready and they are prepared and they, they want to do this. I would say just kind of hold off on that until later. Um, next is working with interpreters. So as I mentioned, you know, the vast majority of our clients are not English speakers. So when they come to us, we need to use interpreters. And if you haven't had to work with an interpreter before, it's, it's a new process. It's a little bit tricky. Um, you're essentially talking to an interpreter and saying to the interpreter, you know, I want you to translate this and say this to your client. But what you need to be doing is talking directly to your client, pretending that Jeff over here, my interpreter, is just a telephone, essentially. And Jeff is just going to parrot and say exactly what I just said to my client. So my conversation should be with that client, not with Jeff. I shouldn't be saying, tell her this. It should be talking directly to my client, client talking directly back to me. Um, and I think, you know, one good thing to do, a lot of us do not have professional interpreters at NIJC. We can't afford to use professional interpreters on a regular basis. So we have, we rely on each other in house. Um, we find out what languages people speak and we use them. Um, a lot of people who have never done this before, you guys are going to find people at your firms that maybe speak Spanish or another language that you can use. And maybe they say, I don't, I have never done interpretation. I don't know how to do this. So really explaining to them what their role is going to be, what the confidentiality expectations are with that role, and sort of laying out those guidelines beforehand. Um, I was going to play a short video for you. I think we have time for it um, that I think just does a really good job of showing you um, what to do and what not to do when working with interpreters. This video will show you how to work with an interpreter if you need help speaking with another person in a different language. What is an interpreter? An interpreter makes it possible for two people who do not speak the same language to understand one another. The interpreter does this by listening to the words you say and orally translating them exactly into words in another language. Now we will show you some examples of how to and how not to work with an interpreter. Tell her I need to ask her some questions so I can understand her situation better. Stop. This is all wrong. To avoid confusion, speak directly to the other person as if he or she could understand you. Do not use phrases like, he said, she said, tell him, tell her. This is how the conversation should go. I need to ask you a few questions so I can understand your situation better. Quisiera hacerle unas preguntas para ver si puedo entender la situación mejor. Sí, gracias. Yes, thank you. Much better. 
Remember to always speak directly to the other person. Now, let's look at another example of how to work with an interpreter. When did you initially move into the apartment? Cuando comenzó a vivir en el apartamento. Pues en el 2006. No recuerdo exactamente. Creo que era en el invierno. Estaba nevando. Creo que el 3 de enero. No, el 5 de enero. It was in 2006, January 5th. Freeze. First of all, the interpreter should repeat the words you say exactly as you say them. The interpreter should not add, leave out, summarize, or change anything to what you say. Let's try that again. When did you initially move into the apartment? ¿Cuándo comenzó a vivir en el apartamento? Pues en el 2006. No recuerdo exactamente. Tuvo que haber sido en el invierno. Estaba nevando. Quizás el 3 de enero. No, el 5 de enero. Well, it was 2006. I don't remember exactly, but it was winter because uh, it was snowing. I don't remember exactly. Maybe it was January 3rd. No, it was January 5th. Much better. On to the next. All right. I, I noticed that her mouth was 1000% not lining up. I have no idea why. And I'm sorry about that. It was very distracting. Uh, but I hope you get the idea. And I hope it was helpful at least a little bit to kind of give examples of what it should look like and what it should not look like. Are we back? All right. All right, we're back. Let's see. All right. Um, so you've seen this slide already one time. Um, and Jeff mentioned there's really three things that you're going to be working on when you're putting together an asylum case with us, the affidavit, corroborating evidence, and then the legal argument. Um, and the reason we sort of put these three things together and we sort of have them in motion is really there's not like a, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three, but you're going to notice that as you're working on one thing, you're going to start working on the second thing, you're going to start working on the third thing. So sometimes, you know, with our hypos that we showed you earlier today, you saw that in one of the cases, it seemed like this is a political opinion type of case. The other one was domestic violence. Maybe though, it's also, there's a gang-based claim going on, right? So the more we talk to our clients, the more these different grounds will pop up. So sometimes you'll get a case file from us from NIJC. It looks like it's a domestic violence claim. But then the more you're working with your client on the affidavit, they're sharing more of their story with you. All of a sudden you're noticing, hey, there's a political opinion claim. So that legal argument is going to change in the brief. So just keeping in mind, these things should be constantly moving in flux as you're working through these cases. So again, Jeff mentioned earlier, the affidavit is going to be the most critical piece of evidence in your in your client's case. Um, and ultimately, you know, the way that the court is going to assess your client is based on they're going to take that affidavit, they're going to read it, they're going to have it ready. And when your client is testifying in court, they are going to be side by side tracking, making sure that everything is consistent between your client's testimony and that affidavit. Um, they're also going to base this credibility determination not only on the consistency of those statements, but what is your client's demeanor? What do they look like in court? Um, how plausible is this claim? Um, but ultimately, the affidavit, if it's well prepared, if it's well fleshed out, is going to go a long way in ensuring that your client is going to be successful in your client's case. So that's where we're going to spend the most time. And that's where we are going to really often start off our cases. Um, I've talked a little bit about the types of clients that we see in these asylum cases, and ultimately you are working with a trauma survivor. So knowing that because your client has gone through all of this, you really have to maybe take a different approach than you normally would when you're going into an affidavit prep session with them. So <clears throat> number one thing is, you know, meeting often again, to build relationship with them, build rapport, build trust with your client, but also for a limited duration, because talking about really difficult, emotionally taxing things is exhausting. And so trying to sit through a four hour affidavit prep session is going to be way too much. Now, I understand there are extenuating circumstances sometimes where a client has driven a very long way to have an in-person session. So you might want to have a longer session with that client, in which case you'd want to break it up. 
You'd want to divide things up. You'd want to maybe intersperse talking about some easier things with some harder things. Um, but definitely trying to limit the amount of time that your client needs to live in this difficult place, going back through oftentimes these traumatic events that happen to them. Um, a second thing that we talk a lot about at NIJC is providing empowerment to our clients. So all of our clients have had power and choices taken away from them, right? They have been forced out of their homes. They have been forced away from their families. They have been forced to leave their countries. Oftentimes they didn't want to leave. They did not want to come to this snowy weather in Chicago, right? But they had to. So they really felt like they had no other choice but to leave to be safe or to keep their family members safe. So what we want to do is we want to empower them by teaching them how to use transportation. We want to empower them by, by letting them know this is your case and you have the agency and the ownership to make choices and decisions about what happens here. So sometimes it can be simple things like, um, where do you want to sit in the room today? Make that choice. It's up to you. Or it can be bigger choices. Like we have to talk about certain things when we are putting together your asylum, uh, your asylum case. We have to talk about what the gang members did to you in the past. We have to talk about your trip to the United States. We have to talk about your life now, and we have to talk about what has happened since and why you're still afraid to go back, even though three years have passed since you came to the U.S. What do you want to talk about today? So letting your clients sort of have those choices about what they're going to do is really helpful. Um, and even letting them know we are going to have to talk about what happened to you and what the gang did to you until 10 o'clock today, but then we're going to stop. And so they know and they can see that clock and they can know I just have to get through this until 10 o'clock and then I get a break and then I can relax again. So so letting them know that um, another thing is really just explaining why, like, why are you asking them how their former partner abused them? Why do you need to know how many times they were punched or beaten or kicked or what kind of weapons were used on them when they were held in prison and they were tortured? You know, why are you asking these terrible, horrible, invasive questions? So really explaining to them, part of the thing that we have to prove in your asylum claims is we have to show that you suffered persecution. And what that means is that you suffered significant harm. It can be physical harm. It can be emotional harm. But we have to prove this. And so by talking about these things and by asking these questions, we are trying to get information to prove this standard in your asylum case. Um, also letting them know we're going to use this information. We're going to share it with the court. But again, asylum proceedings are confidential. This information is not going to be disseminated or shared. We are not going to share it with your family members if you don't give us permission to do so. Oftentimes, our clients will tell you things that they have never told anybody else in their family because they're ashamed or they're embarrassed. Um, but they're going to tell you. So, so letting them know this is confidential. I am, I am, I am preparing this for your case. It's going to go to the court. I don't have permission and I will not share it with anyone else unless you allow me to do so. And that's going to make your, your client comfortable enough to talk to you about these things. Yes. Question. Or yeah, it's not immigration court. Um, there's, there's no written, there's a written transcript of the proceedings that can take place, but in terms of decisions and opinions, the written opinions, um, um, there's, there's basically no, um, there's no court record that would go out. If it goes up on appeal, you can ask that it be, um, that pseudonyms are used and that things can be sealed in that way. So all that information could be anonymized for your client. Um, another kind of important thing to remember is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, trauma survivors oftentimes are going to have memory issues. They're going to struggle to recall and remember things. And oftentimes things are going to come out in like fits and, and spurts. They're going to tell you about something. Then they're going to tell you about something that happened eight years later. Then they're going to tell you about something that happened six years earlier. And things are going to sort of flip back and forth in a way that's dizzying and difficult to track sometimes. And so that's where you come in. And that's where your job becomes really, really important is trying to put things in a narrative that makes sense, that is chronological, that makes sense, that flows. Um, and oftentimes we are going to find inconsistencies because memory is fallible and because, you know, sometimes these incidents happen 10 years ago. And if I were to ask anyone in here, what happened to you 10 years ago on this date? I bet you'd have a hard time remembering. So to expect clients to be perfectly consistent about everything they say is going to be really difficult. Um, and as Jeff mentioned earlier, you know, when clients come into the country, oftentimes if they're apprehended by border officials, they are interviewed. They're given what's called a credible fear interview where they um, make statements about what happened to them and why they are afraid to go back to their home country. And sometimes we'll get those transcripts when we file our FOIA requests, and then we'll cross check those with the affidavit that we are drafting and preparing. And we'll see that everything is not exactly lining up. 
totally normal. So what we have to do then is go back to our clients and try to figure out, well, what happened? Why did you say this? Did you say this? Did they, you know, not accurately represent what you said? Um, We had a client recently we were working with who's a French speaker and he was interviewed by a Spanish speaking officer. So, you know, some of his statements aren't exactly lining up with what he's telling us now, but it was because he wasn't speaking his native language when he was interviewed. So it makes sense. Um, And then finally, again, you know, easing your client out after you're having some of these difficult conversations with them. Um, making sure that you start on sort of a lighter note. And then again, easing them out of this traumatic place that they've been in sometimes into back into sort of reality and normal life um, with some lighter conversation before you leave. Um, When you're working on an affidavit, um, the things to remember are, you know, we want it to sound like your client is talking. So your client's going to testify in court. We want that affidavit to sound just like them. So when the judge reads it, and then they hear that testimony in the court, it's going to sound the same. So really thinking when you're talking to your client, when you're interviewing your client, what are the phrases that they're using? What is their level of education? What kinds of vocabulary are they using? Writing down some of those phrases and interjecting those into the affidavit are really going to help give your client's voice um, a presence in that affidavit. Another thing that I highly recommend is crafting events in chronological order. Um, I've seen a lot of affidavits in my day. So as Jeff, um, we read these all the time. Um, And I would say sometimes attorneys like to do like a thematic approach where they talk about like all of the stuff that happened related to political opinion and then all the stuff that happened related to domestic violence. But it ping pongs you back from like 1995 to 2006, back to 1990, back to 2010. And it's really difficult as the reader to follow the story and the logic of like what is happening. And I really think chronological order helps to explain like why individuals end up getting to a point where they need to flee the country and leave and, and, you know, why they need to be seeking asylum. So I would highly recommend a chronological approach. Um, Oftentimes clients struggle with chronology. They struggle with remembering when things happen. So what we do a lot is make a timeline on a piece of paper. And if they give us one event, we'll have that event listed. And then we'll sort of backtrack. Did this happen before or after this? Were there any big events in your life? How old was your kid when this event happened? So sometimes just using other sort of milestone events in their lives to try to help you create that timeline can be a really helpful tool. Um, Another thing is just, you know, you're eliciting information. We want to know who was there because we might want to try to get an affidavit from them too. We want to know what happened. We want to know why did it happen? Why did he say that to you? Why did he do that to you? Um, We want to know how did you get out of there? Maybe how did you escape from prison? How did this happen? Um, And, you know, yeah, all the, all those things you're going to be asking all of those questions as you go. Um, And then really this affidavit is a tool to, um, you know, demonstrate your client's eligibility for asylum. So all of the elements that Jeff talked about past persecution on account of a protected ground, the government is unable and unwilling to protect Um, it would not be safe and reasonable for this person to go back there. All of these elements, I should be able to read an affidavit and check off. Yes, 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 yes. Your client has demonstrated eligibility for asylum just based on that one document that you produce. Um, and then finally, um, we, we talk a lot about how much detail should we include in an affidavit? We want it to be detailed, but we don't want it to be so detailed that minor inconsistencies are going to trip up our client. So sometimes dates are really important and really critical. The specific date something happened, if they participated in a protest and it was a well-documented protest, we're going to want that specific date. But if your client was abused by their spouse over the course of five years, it doesn't have to be on May 8th, you know, 2010 at 1.59 p.m., this happened to me. Because who's going to remember that level of detail? And again, when your client gets nervous and needs to testify about these things, there's a really good chance that their mind's going to go blank and they're not going to remember those things. And it's going to create an inconsistency where there really is no inconsistency and we shouldn't need to worry about it. So really thinking how much detail do I need? When do I need to include them? When do I not need to include them? Um, And then the biggest thing is checking with consistency with those other documents. So we don't want any surprises. We want to figure out a way to sort of make sure that all of the different stories come together in a way that makes sense for our client. And so doing a lot of cross-checking, I would say, is a a critical thing to think about as you're working on these affidavits as well. Um, So here's sort of three what not to do examples that we put up a lot of times. Um, because we see these things happen. Um, so the first one, I was persecuted because I belong to the group of Salvadoran females in relationships. They are unable to leave. 
So just, just saying to yourself, would anyone ever say that? And the answer is absolutely not, right? So even the word persecution, persecution is sort of a legal term of art. It's not really a term that our clients would use. So maybe they'd say, I was hurt, I was harmed, I was beaten, I was threatened. So maybe those are words that we would use in place of that word. And again, using the particular social group language is not something we would see. So instead, I he abused me because he said I was his woman. He abused me because he said I didn't listen to him and I needed to learn how to behave. So those might be the types of things where we're going to get at the same type of idea, but we're not going to use political, uh, particular social group language there. The second example, again, we just have too much legalese. So this should not sound like a lawyer wrote it. It should sound like your client is talking. Keep that in mind as you're working on these affidavits. So again, in this second example here, we have a lot of vocabulary that, that probably is not going to be used by the vast majority of our clients. Um, and at the end, the CTAB P DOS human rights report. So we're going to see that in your legal argument, in your brief that you're going to be submitting to the court. We are not going to see it in affidavits. And oftentimes people will say CTAB B, birth certificate of my daughter. No one's going to say that. If it wouldn't come out of your client's mouth, we shouldn't see it in the affidavit. Um, and then the final example is kind of what we were talked about in, in terms of too much detail. So on May 1st, 2010, three gang members stopped me uh, after school and threatened me. Maybe it was three gang members, but maybe it was four, maybe it was two, maybe your client is going to say something different. So maybe just a group of or several gang members would be fine. And around May of 2010 would be fine as well, unless there is something really specifically important about May 1st and a reason that we need to include that date. So before you um, are going to, as you're kind of working on a case and you're working up a draft of the affidavit, um, we'll always ask to review it. And the reason we ask for that is just to kind of make sure you're covering all the elements of the case, make sure you're on the right track, um, just to make sure, you know, we have a retainer on file with these clients too. We consider them our clients still. And we, we just want to make sure that we are advocating the best that we can for these clients to have the best outcomes. So the four things I would say that we see the most and that we want more information about the most in affidavits that we review is number one, voice. It doesn't sound like your client is talking. It sounds like a lawyer wrote it. Number two, it doesn't cover all the asylum elements. So maybe it covers some of them, but sometimes, and I would say a lot of times, um, we'll have, um, we're using the example of, of women who are in, you know, a domestic um relationship where there's been some abuse. And in certain countries, women won't even bother to go to the police because they know that it won't do any good. They know the police will say, you need to start behaving. You need to listen to your husband. They won't even take a police report. So they don't even bother going, or they fear that if they do go and they make a report and their husband finds out about it, the abuse is going to be worse when they come home. So they're not going to report at all. So because they don't report, there's nothing in the affidavit about them reporting because they didn't do it. But what you'll need to say is, I didn't go to police and report because I knew they wouldn't protect me. I knew that if I reported, it might even put me in more danger. Then we're addressing that element, right? So really thinking to yourself, have I covered all these elements in my affidavit? Um, we talked about consistency with other documents. In a lot of your cases, you're going to get supplemental affidavits from other individuals. So maybe somebody was home um, with your client when they were arrested by the police. You're going to want to try to reach out to that person. You're going to try to want to get an affidavit from them too. And then you're going to cross-check those affidavits every time, right? Because again, they might not line up. Our job is to make sure they line up. Our job is to make sure we're not creating um, inconsistencies for our clients. And then the last thing that I would say is context and background is important. So a lot of the work that you're going to do is trying to educate the court about your client's country of origin. You're going to do a bunch of research on your client's country, which is usually really interesting and really fun. Um, you're going to have that sort of as a background in your brief, but also in your client's affidavit. You want to lay some groundwork. So an example that I would say I see a lot is gang-based cases where we have a kid who is threatened by gang members who are trying to recruit him to join the gang. And the kid gets so scared that he flees and he comes to the U.S. And so the brief just starts off by saying gang members um, came to me and they told me wanted, they wanted to join. And so I fled to the United States the next day, period. And you're like, um, why did you flee to the United States the next day just after the gang tried to recruit you? It doesn't make a lot of sense unless we understand and we have a framework of how does this gang operate? What happens to people who refuse to join the gang? We need that information first before we can really understand your client's claim and why that threat was a credible one. So corroboration. Affidavit, number one important thing you're going to do, but corroboration is the number two most important thing that you're going to do in these cases. 
So the standard in you know, immigration court for asylum cases is that the credible testimony of your client standing alone should be sufficient to support their, their burden of proof. However, the judge is going to want corroborating evidence. And so really the standard there is, do they have the corroborating evidence? And if not, can they obtain it? If they can't, okay. But it's really, you need to have corroboration unless you can't get it. And you've reasonably tried to obtain it and you can't get it. So an example of that would be police report, right? Somebody says, um, the gang threatened me, so I went to the police and I reported. So bing, first question, where's the police report? Do you have the police report? Client says, no, I don't have a copy of the police report. So we say, can you get a copy of the police report? And so they say, okay, I'll, I'll ask my family members if they can get the police report. And family members say, I'm too afraid to go to the police station because I know that the gang is watching the police station. If I try to go and get a copy of this report, I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me too. So what are we going to do? We don't have a police report. Are we going to write nothing about it in the affidavit? Or are we going to say, I don't have a copy of the police report. I tried to get a copy of it. My family members were too afraid to go to the police station because gang members were hanging out there and they were afraid of what would happen to them if they got it. Then we have satisfied the standard. We have done what we needed to do to try to produce that corroborating evidence. So really each and every element, as you're going through, you're going to try to corroborate it, or you're going to explain why you cannot corroborate, why you cannot get it. So this chart we love. Um, I still use this and I go through this when I'm working on my own cases sometimes just to think, what can I get? What can I think about? Um, what can I obtain? So there's really sort of four buckets that we're thinking about as we're working through these cases in terms of what we want to get. Um, country conditions evidence is number one, right? So we need to we need to pretend that the court knows absolutely nothing about your client's country of origin. We need to do the research for them. We need to make it really easy for them to understand what was going on in your client's country of origin, why it would not be safe or reasonable for your client to go back. So we really look to a lot of these sources on the left-hand side of the chart here, just for basic information about what is happening in your client's country of origin. These are just a jumping off starting point. Um, it is non-exhaustive. You can look at anything, newspaper articles, reports, ask your client. You know, were there any articles about this? Was that event you told me about in any of the newspapers in your hometown? If so, try to get those things and read them and submit them along with your filing. Um, we also want information that's going to be specific to your client. So um, if your client suffered physical injuries, um, we're going to say, did you document it? Do you have any photographs of bruising or any of the injuries that you suffered? Um, you know, did you go to the hospital? Do you have any hospital records? Um, did you make a police report? Do you have the police report? Um, it can really be anything along those lines. Um, another important thing is going to be witnesses, other witnesses. Who was there? Who did you talk to? Who did you tell about these things? Um, who knows about the same things? We're going to try to get statements from these individuals. And a lot of the times they are not going to be here in the United States. Um, so we are going to have to get in touch with them in their home countries. What we normally do is we'll get on a phone call with them. We will ask them a lot of questions. We will try to gather information. We will then draft the affidavit ourselves in-house for them. We'll read it back to them over the phone. And then basically we'll ask them to uh, take a picture of their identity documents and usually write out a short attestation that everything, uh, the statement was read back to them and everything is true and correct. And we will submit that along with the filing. Um, Oftentimes, too, for past persecution, if there's physical harm that took place, we can try to get a forensic medical evaluation done. Um, we have resources and contacts that we can connect you with so that your client can have an evaluation so the doctor can sort of document all the scarring um, and sort of track how that lines up with and corroborates the story that they told you. Um, a lot of times, though, our clients don't have any physical injuries, but they have a lot of emotional harm. Um, they have a really difficult time opening up. Um, a lot of, you know, psychological damage has been done. A lot of our clients suffer from PTSD or depression or other things as a side effect of what they have gone through. So again, trying to hook them up with counseling resources, getting psychological evaluations done can be really helpful support for their asylum cases as well. Um, and then when we're talking about future persecution, you know, we need to prove there's a reasonable possibility that your client is going to be harmed in the future if they go back, right? It's really tough to prove something that hasn't happened yet. So what we need to do again is rely on country conditions evidence to say similarly situated individuals. So people just like my client who was a member of this opposition political party, this is the way they are being treated by the current government in this country is going to be strong support for your future persecution arguments. 
um, trying to get affidavits from similarly situated individuals. So sometimes we have family members, one family member managed to come to the United States and they're applying for asylum, but other family members are still living in hiding back in home country. Getting affidavits from those individuals to talk about their current situation, to talk about you know why it would not be safe or reasonable for your client to go back because they are currently needing to move around and relocate in order to stay safe from harm is going to be powerful evidence of future harm in your case. Um, and then finally, experts. So a lot of times firms have resources, which is a wonderful thing, um, and can hire experts to help support these cases. The expert affidavits can win cases. I've seen in a lot of a lot of instances where basically the expert can come in and say, I've been on the ground, I've been in this country, I've interviewed people, I've worked with these clients, and I can tell you that I believe that if this client were to return to this country, there is a reasonable possibility that they would they would face persecution because of their circumstances and their situation. So having that expert to sort of kind of put icing on top of the, the pile of corroborating evidence that you are collecting is great. All right, I think we're going to skip this because we are running short on time. Um, so we'll just talk about practice tips. So how are we going to get corroborating evidence? I would say number one is ask your client. Who did you talk to? Who did you tell about this? Who was there with you when this happened? Um, do you know of any other evidence that we can collect to support your case? So we're working with a client currently who participated in some political protests and demonstrations, and he had some photographs um, of himself wearing his political party's T-shirt, participating in a protest in a rally. He was shortly thereafter arrested and detained. Um, and so he said, I, well, I've got these photos of myself participating in a protest wearing my party T-shirt. Great. We're going to use that and we're going to submit that along with your claim to show that you were a part of this political party. Sometimes your client says, I have a membership card. Great. We're going to use that and we're going to submit that along with their case. Um, the federal rules of evidence do not apply, um, which is a wonderful thing in terms of what comes in. So hearsay rules do not apply. So it can be a statement of someone who says, well, I heard this. Well, she told me and those statements all come in. So definitely think about that. Um, also, you know, things like text messages. Sometimes we have clients who receive threatening text messages from gang members or other individuals. Take screenshots of those, submit those along with your filing. They come in. So you can be creative. You can think about pretty much anything you can think of is fair game to introduce as evidence in these cases. And so use it. Um, one thing that I will just a kind of a, a small disclaimer here is that sometimes um, clients feel a lot of pressure when you're saying, well, what else do you have? Well, what else do you have? Well, what else can you get? And they think that they need additional evidence to support your case. So all of a sudden, sometimes miraculously, a document will appear. And that document maybe looks a little suspicious. And I would say that documents from foreign countries sometimes look a little suspicious. But if you know you're kind of giving it a smell test and you're thinking, I'm, I'm, I don't know about this document um, that didn't appear for eight months and all of a sudden it's here, um, establish chain of custody. So sometimes if client says, well, I got this sent to me from somebody back in home country, great. Where's the envelope? Let's see it. Let's take a look at it. Um, and, you know, trying to just prove up that everything is, is, is kosher with that document. If for some reason you think, you know, ah, this document makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to submit it. Don't submit it. Leave it out of the filing is what I would recommend in those cases. Um, and then a last caveat is that all foreign documents have to be translated into English. So if you have a birth certificate from a foreign country or a newspaper article or anything else along those lines or police report, you need to submit a translation along with a certificate of translation um, along with that filing. All right, so I'm going to turn it. Um, we were supposed to take a really short break, but we're running a little short on time. So are you guys cool if we just continue to plow through things? I think we'll need that here. Yeah. yeah. And then let's add in a CLE code here. Um, so we can add in, you can say this people online, but first CLE code is SNOW, S-N-O-W. So the SNOW. first CLE code is SNOW, S-N-O-W. You'll need it in the evaluation. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. So um, continuing around um, that circle of elements of um, your submissions and um, we're moving from the affidavit to the brief. Oh, sorry, from the corroborating evidence to the brief. And um, the first thing is to highlight that you do not have a lot of space in an immigration court brief to make your um, argument. The um, Immigration Court Practice Manual limits um, length to 25 pages, 
um, these are double space pages. And, <coughs> excuse me. And there are some circumstances where a case is complicated or there are multiple forms of relief, multiple respondents consolidated in one case. There, there are certain circumstances where you can move for more pages than that. But generally, you want to keep to this 25 page limit. Um, there, there, there are certainly instances where immigration judges will not approve the, um, they won't grant the motion for extra pages. And um, really, you want to try to keep things as concise and as possible. Um, while you're working the brief um, and all the way through anything about the case, you want to keep those asylum elements we mentioned can, um, completely distinct from each other. Um, make sure not to conflate them. You want to focus on Seventh Circuit case law, as we discussed before. Um, generally, you want to avoid out of circuit federal cases. Um, yeah, federal court cases um, and stick to some circuit and BIA case law. Um, we are happy and excited to review it. As Rachel mentioned, you know, we um, remain on as um, attorneys for these clients. And so um, we, we would like to review the brief as well. And you wanna make sure that you're preserving all arguments and claims to relief. Um, so an easy example of that is in addition to applying for asylum, you want to make sure that you're clearly applying for withholding of removal and cap protection as well. Um, if there is a potential past persecution claim, you want to make sure that you're arguing that in the brief. You don't want to leave anything out at the trial level because um, you want to make sure that all these arguments are in front of the immigration judge. They're making the decision and in play if there's going to be an appeal. And um, we have a link to a handy webinar that you can um, look into for this. Um, okay, case timing for the immigration court. This is um, hard to predict um, in, in many cases. Um, you know, um, so as we kind of mentioned briefly before that there's some current flux in the immigration court with new judges being hired, and um, that's going to be affecting the um, timelines of um, cases. And honestly, we're just at a point where it's really, really hard to, to say how long a, course, a case will remain in the backlog. Um, you can see that historically, the backlog of immigration cases has um, been growing, and particularly in the past five or so years, it, it's grown fairly substantially. Um, you know, which means that in many cases, people um, end up waiting years for the merits hearing. Um, in some cases, it could, could be a decade or more that, that, that someone's waiting for the merits hearing. Um, Generally, a decade is kind of an outlier, but um, just to give you a sense that um, the, the backlogs are quite substantial, um, but again, they, they are starting to move faster, and um, it's really impossible to predict at the moment when you get a case how fast it's going to move. Um, so you that's another reason why you want to be checking the um, EOIR system to see what dates are assigned. And if your client's facing some kind of hardship where they need the case to move faster, there are um, motions that can be made and kind of ways to try to speed things up. And so um, you, you would want to communicate that to your NIJC point of contact and we can talk about how to um, try to get it moving as quickly as possible. During the whole time that the case is pending, um, you know, there, there, there's some just general ongoing things that you want to be doing and working on. Um, so all the way through, you want to be determining what um, evidence is important, um, what going back to that um, cooperation chart that um, Rachel went over um, and just trying to get a sense of um, what the universe of evidence that you would like to have is. Um, asking your client to try, try to um, reach out to family or whoever has needed to try to gather that evidence. And, you know, remember that if you're gathering evidence from abroad, it's going to take a while. So you want to get started on this early and keep kind of revisiting and thinking about um, what evidence is available. And to the extent it's not available, documenting the reasons why it isn't available. Um, 
a lot of clients um, are, you know, for, for obvious reasons and situations where they would benefit from um, therapy, counseling, um, and we can help um, in locating referrals, but you should think about whether that's something your, your client needs. Um, but, and also for the hearing, having reports from therapists and or medical doc doctors who can do forensic evaluations can be extremely helpful um, in terms of proving the case. Um, so, so if you think that that is something that, um, you know, would be relevant to your client, that, that that is another thing to explore. And again, um, we can help identify professionals who can help out with that stuff. Um, it's really important that you maintain contact, especially if the case is pending for a while. Um, you know, there might not always be an impending hearing or um, court day, but you want to keep talking with the client, make sure that, um, you know, you keep up that rapport, you keep up that relationship. And, um, and, and there, there, there will be things like um, renewing work authorization, things like that, that, that you will need to practically even touch about. But, but, but I mean, just in general, trying to keep an ongoing relationship um, rather than just, um, you know, kind of losing touch for a while. And then once you have an impending court hearing, trying to um, reconnect, um, that, 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 that's a really kind of risky way to handle things. Um, especially for people who might have housing instability and things like that. If, if you don't speak with them for a long period of time, um, the odds of permanently losing touch go up. And um, obviously we, we want to always avoid that. Um, and if you ever are having difficulty, like getting in contact with the client, that they're, they're just, you know, um, the contact information isn't current, their phone, um, maybe they, they, they couldn't pay the bill, it's turned off. Um, let your NIJC contact know right away that, that you're not able to contact the person. Um, and yeah, and, and again, as, as, as I mentioned, you want to keep up with work authorizations while the case is pending. And that is um, the, a little bit of a complicated field, but but again, um, it's something that we'll um, touch on in, in the cover letter. Um, but, but the thing to know about work authorization is that there is a... Um, Provision, um, the um, good sense of which can be questioned, um, stating that an asylum seeker needs to wait 150 days before applying for work authorization after applying for asylum. And then uh, it's another 30 days, 180 days total, all, um, when it can be granted. Um, and so, you know, if the client is at the start of the process, they haven't filed the I 589 yet, they may not have um, hit that deadline for. Um, applying for the work authorization. And um, the counting of the 150 days, 180 days is um, something that, that's referred to as the asylum clock. Um, so, so, so basically from the time you um, file that application, the clock's running. And um, an applicant calls delay can stop the clock. So let's say um, you ask for a continuance of the court hearing before the 150 days has passed that's something that could result in a clock stoppage. And that means it will greatly, greatly delay um, the person's ability to um, apply for, 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 for the work authorization. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's just one thing to keep in mind that um, to our extent possible, we, um, we wanna avoid applicant cause delays in the asylum process. Um, while that clock is running. Um, and you, after the one days, you can apply for the initial work authorization. And then once you have that, um, every two years, um, you will need to renew it. And um, you should plan to renew 180 days before the expiration date on the old EAD. Um, and it's really incredibly important to get these applications in on time. Um, a disruption in work eligibility can just have like um, life upending consequences for people. So um, it, it's incredibly important to, to, to um, keep on top of these dates. Um, other things to um, keep track of are just major events in your clients' lives. Um, 
you know, we make clear to them from the beginning that they should keep us apprised of any marriages if they are victims of crime, if um, obviously they change address, um, things like that, that, that they should immediately be telling your attorney. Um, you know, I, I would recommend having a similar conversation when you begin representation, um, make sure that they're in communication with you about any major changes um, because uh, um, life events, and for us, it's just important to understand um, where your client's coming from and what, what they're going through, what headspace they're in. But it's also really important because they can have immigration um, uh, those types of immigration provision can um, come into play with things like marriage or um, I, I don't know what's with me in microphones today. I apologize to everyone for this for some reason. Um, I'm having issues. Um, but but so keep in track, um, keep in touch and keep on top of major life developments. Um, obviously you need to know if they're applying for any other immigration benefit. They should not be filing any immigration benefits um, without consulting with you and consulting with NIJC. Um, because mobile applications can conflict with each other. Um, there, there's just a lot of problems that could potentially come up. So um, that's another thing which I communicate clearly at the beginning and you wanna make sure that they're aware of, um, they should not be applying for anything with USCIS, um, for example, without consulting with you. And um, if you think something's happened, you know, that, that might make your client um, eligible for another form of relief or Conversely, that say a criminal conviction that you think might make them um, no longer eligible for asylum, let us know right away. We can talk through it and figure out um, what the next steps are in, in, in that case. Um, but you know, the, the the kind of main message here is just, you know, there's the life of the old case, but people also have real lives and lots of things happen in them, and we want to keep on top of that. Um, Okay, moving into the kind of logistics of what you need to file. Um, there are two main filings. Um, the appearance and the application are the, the first filing. And then um, for the actual hearing day, when you get to the merits hearing, there's a packet that um, is mainly um, that, that circle that we keep looking at, the affidavit, legal argument, and corroborating evidence. Um, and, and this specifically breaks down into the brief legal argument, client affidavit, um, notice of any amendments to the I-589. Um, there might be updates or things that were just wrong in the um, first I-589, and you want to clarify that at the get-go at the hearing. Um, an annotated index will show you what that is in a second, and then all of the supporting document that you uh, um, documentation that you have. Um, and anything you file, you need to make sure that you serve on DHS. This is um, what we mean by an annotated affidavit um, index that um, with your filing, you're going to want to have a detailed index um, showing all of the uh, various um, exhibits and also pulling the um, key quotes from the country conditions evidence to make it nice and digestible for the immigration judge. Um, and yeah, and, and, and so that, that's essentially the, the, the format for the index. And it's really helpful to make it this detailed because that way the judge can look at it in a glance and know um, everything that's contained in your filing and know all the key points from your country conditions. Um, in terms of the format of the filing, um, your best friend is the Immigration Court Practice Manual. It has um, pretty much all of the details you need to know about the form of um, filing, it, it's um, available online and it, it, it's um, relatively clear and easy to work with. Obviously, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to us for technical support. Um, and then you want to annotate your index, highlight the important info in the country condition report. So in addition to pointing the quotes, um, going through and highlighting in the documents themselves where the key information is. If it's a paper case, you're going to want to two-hole punch everything at the top and make sure it's printed single-sided. Um, if it's an e-filing case, obviously that, that's not gonna be relevant. Um, either way, you need tabs. And on a paper case, those are actually like physical tabs, like little stickies that you write letters on and you stick to all of your exhibits. Um, in the um, electronic filing case, it's 
a piece of paper that says tab A that you put in front of the exhibit when, when, when you um, file it. And you should have those pieces of paper in the paper filing as well, but you're just sticking sticky tabs to them in the paper version, whereas obviously you don't need to stick sticky tabs if it's going online. Um, <coughs> the paper filings um, go to the court window at the immigration court. Um, and um, can hand deliver or um, courier deliver those. Um, if it doesn't meet all the formatting requirements that we just mentioned, they could be rejected. Um, and typically the um, timing is everything's due 15 days before the merits hearing. That's the timeline that's um, kind of specified um, across the board but any particular IJ can set a different timeline. And so for example, um, some IJs will want them 30 minutes beforehand. Um, they will have to tell you expressly if that's the case. Um, so if you don't hear anything different, um, you can stick with 15 minutes. Um, if, it's an, uh, if, if it's an electronic case, you file electronically, that the, um, one of the main practical differences is ICE um, DHS will be served automatically if it's online filing. Um, otherwise, you will need to serve DHS separately, either um, using their um, e-filing service, which is their preferred method of service. You register an account with ICE and, and you just upload everything there, or you can mail it to them. Um, in either event, whether it's automatically served or you're completing service yourself, um, you need to have a certificate of service. Um, they will, the court will not accept a filing without the certificate of service. So make sure you always include that and make sure that any um, signatures comply with the um, EOIR guidelines. So either a written signature or they have particular forms of, uh, particular forms of digital signature that are um, acceptable, um, but what signature is probably safest. Um, in terms of getting your client ready, um, you, you want to run through the, um, questioning a few times, both direct and cross. Um, we recommend three full prep sessions, uh, three prep sessions, one that's just kind of full run through of everything you're planning to do. One um, that's kind of tougher asking some hard questions, putting them on the spot as much as you think you can, you know, can com comfortably do without freaking them out. And then the last one is kind of a confidence builder. Go easy on the questions, go short, um, just make them, as ready as possible to go in and testify about some very challenging things. Um, and you will want to explain kind of the um, process and the um, format of the hearing as completely as possible be beforehand so that they know what to expect. Um, and it's a reminder to um, practice both the direct exam and some cross-examination questions. Um, it's really, really helpful to educate your client on the relevant law so that they understand um, what are the key points that um, you need to make and what are the um, details that you need to focus on. So just explaining what the asylum elements are um, and how they relate to your client's situation can be really, really helpful. Um, you know, uh, they, clients want to give as strong testimony as possible and it, it really helps them if they have that kind of context. Um, and you want to manage expectations, never go in you know, like guaranteeing a, a win or, or even a decision the day of. Um, you know, you don't want to set um, any false expectations and you want to um, empower your client as much as possible. Um, you know, let them know that this is um, they're hearing their, their story that you're um, trying to help them tell it as well as possible. And to the extent that anything comes up on cross that they don't know, they're allowed to say that they don't know the answers or they don't understand the question or tell the attorney to repeat the question if, if they didn't catch it. Um, and just making sure they understand that they have at least that amount of control over the process can be um, really helpful. Um, on your end, you wanna make sure that you reach out to the um, opposing counsel beforehand, um, make sure that they actually received your filing um, and it didn't get lost in the um, ICE offices after you served it. Um, and it's helpful to talk with um, the 
ICE attorney about um, what their position is on the case, um, what issues they see as most salient, um, and you know whether there's any part of the um, argument that they would stipulate to or any documents that they would stipulate to the authenticity, accuracy of, et cetera. Um, we, we definitely recommend reaching out before hearings, can be extremely helpful. Um, talk with us. We will give you all the information that we have, anything we can tell you about the judge or opposing counsel that we think um, would be helpful. Um, you know, and we're happy to just brainstorm and strategize. Um, it, it's actually kind of fun having just like brainstorming conversations. So feel, feel free to do that. Um, you know, to call any time that um, you think it would be helpful to talk through things. Um, review our procedural manual again, because it's great, it's amazing, and it has um, all of the kind of um, pieces of what you should expect in the merits hearing, and it kind of walks you through it step by step, and that, that, that way you have a very clear picture of what you're going into and what you need to prepare the client for. Then afterwards, um, you know, hopefully asylum will be granted and um, please let us know immediately in that case so we can celebrate and get in touch with the client about benefits that will um, that they will become eligible for but have a deadline on them. Um, and there are various documents that um, are important to obtain. Um, we'll, we'll again touch base with you on how to do that. And you can refer the, um, the client to us to apply for any derivative family members who um, they may be now eligible to apply for now that they've been um, granted asylum. If it's denied, remember there's still a right to appeal. Um, you want to reserve the right to appeal at the hearing. Again, let us know immediately. And um, we, we can help you with um, filing an appeal to the BIA. It's a relatively straightforward process. Um, and you know, there's still an opportunity to, to argue the case in, in that forum. So, um, you know, to, to, um, just keep calm in that scenario and, um, and can take it from there. Um, and of course, <laughs> so I feel like I should have done this in the opposite order because the tone really shifts from like, if it's denied to, um, <laughs> <laughs> how you should feel afterwards. But hopefully by the time it's over, you will be in a mood to celebrate and you will be excited to take on another case, to recruit your colleagues, take on other cases. Um, as Rachel said, we have a lot of cases to place. And if you help us place the case now, that means we can take more in the future and help more and more people. So, you know, the, the, the more um, you're recruiting your um, friends and colleagues, the, the, the better for everyone. And we certainly appreciate that kind of support. Um, and, you know, there are lots of people in situations similar to your future clients who are facing all kinds of struggles with our immigration system. And anything you can do um, to advocate for better um, access to justice for them is, is, again, greatly appreciated by everyone all around. Um, and, you know, if, if you're in a place to donate, that, that's also wonderful. Um, and so with that, we will wrap up. For the CLE, um, you will need to follow this QR code on the screen and fill out a, um, a survey there. Make sure to get your name and your um, bar identification on there. Um, for more information about the uh, particular projects, you can reach out to the contacts on the earlier presentation, um, or for questions, you can reach out to Lily, whose email and phone number is on the screen, and follow us on the, uh, the social media. Second CLE code word is justice. Justice, like natural immigrant justice center. And um, for everyone following online, the second CRE is Justice, as in National Immigrant Justice Center. Um, strongly recommend you take out your devices and just do the CLE now. Um, we will need a report soon, so the QR code there if you can't get it. If you don't need a PowerPoint, um, strongly recommend that. Uh, um, and 
last thing I know we said we questions at the end. We're actually completely out of time. So if you have any questions, um, please reach out to us and thank you all for attending.